Ms. Orr. Commissioner, the next witness is Mr. Bradley James from Rabobank. <coughs> Mr. James, once you've settled your papers, would you prefer to take an oath or make an affirmation? An affirmation, please. Affirm the witness, please. I solemnly and sincerely. I solemnly and sincerely. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence that I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, Mr. James. Do sit down. <coughs> yes, Mr. McGrath. Uh, please state your full name. Uh, my full name is Bradley Mark James. <coughs> And your business address? It's 74 Victoria Parade in Rockhampton. And you are the regional manager for Southern Queensland and Northern New South Wales for Rubberbank Australia Limited? Yes, I am. Uh, you have received a summons to appear before the Commission, haven't you? Yes, I have. And do you have that summons with you in the witness box? I do. Commissioner, I tender that summons. Exhibit 4.32, the summons to Mr James. Mr James, you have made two witness statements for the purposes of the Commission, uh, case study number 4-16. That's correct. And the first of those is dated the 15th of June 2018. That's correct. And do you have that statement with you in the witness box? I do. Um, are the contents of that statement true and correct? Yes, they are. Uh, Commissioner, I tender that statement. Exhibit 4.33, the statement of... Mr. James dated 15 June 18. Your second witness statement is dated 22 June 2018. That's correct. And do you have that statement with you in the witness box? Yes, I do. Are the contents of that statement true and correct? Yes, they are. Uh, Commissioner, I tender that statement. Exhibit 4.34, statement of Mr. James dated 22 June 18. Thank you, Commissioner. Nothing further. Yes, thank you. Yes, Ms. Hall. Mr James, we've just heard that you're Rabobank's regional manager for southern Queensland and northern New South Wales. That's correct. And you've been put forward by Rabobank to answer questions about Rabobank's agricultural banking operations and about Rabobank's interactions with Wendy and Adrian Brower. That's correct. You tell us in your statement that you're responsible for the overall commercial and prudential oversight and human resources management of your region. That's correct. And how far north and south does your area of responsibility extend? The northernmost branch is Rockhampton and the southernmost branch is Armidale in northern New South Wales. Now you've been either a state or regional manager with Rabobank since November 2011? That's correct. And what did you do before that? I was a regional manager under an old structure with Rabobank also. Now Rabobank's a subsidiary of a Dutch multinational bank? That's correct. And historically it's focused on agricultural lending? Correct. And is agricultural lending Rabobank's primary focus in Australia? Sole focus. And Rabobank aims to be the leading rural lender in Australia? That is what we aspire to. Uh, and do you agree with me that Rabobank seeks to achieve that goal by focusing specifically on food and agribusiness, by proactively managing client relationships, by employing staff with knowledge of agribusiness and implementing strong credit processes to maintain a quality portfolio? Yes, we do. The Rabobank currently has 61 rural branches in Australia, is that right? That's correct. And how many of those branches are in your region? Nine. And in your statement, you categorise Rabobank's agricultural or country clients in two ways. Um, rural banking clients, uh, who are primary producers, and major agri clients, who are middle market clients whose operations go beyond the farm gate and include processing and manufacture. That's Is that correct. right? That's correct. Um, what's the range of the size of loans held by Rabobank rural banking clients in your region? Uh, they range from $500,000 uh, to upwards of $140 million. 
And you tell us in your statement that as at the end of last year, Rabobank had approximately 34,000 agricultural clients. That's correct. And approximately 11,000 of them had loans with Rabobank. That's correct. And Rabobank's greatest lending exposure is in broadacre farming, beef, sheep and grain. That's correct. Okay. Now, in the course of preparing to give evidence, you've reviewed Rabobank's records in respect of the Browers? Yes, I have. Uh, and you were here when Mrs Brower gave evidence then? Yes, I was. Thank you. Now, the Browers became clients of Rabobank in May 2005? Yes. And at the time, their account was managed by a relationship manager who you've heard uh, his name is the subject of a non-publication direction? Yes. Uh, how long had the relationship manager, or the bank manager as I'll call him, how long had he been with Rabobank at that time? Uh, I think two to three years. Okay. Now you heard Mrs Brower's evidence that at the time she and her husband became clients of Rabobank, they entered into a facility with a limit of 700000 and a 15 year term. Yes. It was an all-in-one facility, is that right? Yes. What's an all-in-one facility? Uh, the, the core component of the funding, which is the property purchase aspect of the loan, as well as the working capital requirement, is bundled into one loan. I see. And at the time of the original facility, the bank took security over the Browers property, Kaiora? Yes. And that mortgage would have amply secured uh, a facility of 700000 Certainly. Yes. And the bank also took security over a water allocation? Uh, yes. And then in September 2005, August or September 2005, the Browers enter into the second facility for 200000 yes. is that right? Uh, also with a 15-year term? I believe the term would have been um, concurrent with the existing term. Yes, I see. Yeah. So a few months shorter than... 15 years because we're a few months later. Yes, I see. And that second facility was also secured over Kaiora? Yes. And you heard the evidence that the limit of the first facility was increased firstly to 800,000 and secondly to 1 million? That's correct. Okay. Uh, and the term remained the same? Yes. And is it usual to increase a facility limit without changing the facility's expiry term? Unless it has an imminent expiry term, yes. Okay. Now, you heard Mrs Brower's evidence that in March 2009, she and her family moved to the United States with the intention of staying for a few years? Yes. Uh, and you heard her evidence that before they left, they sold all of their cattle and they leased Kaiora to another family, far farming family uh, for three years with a two-year option to renew? Yes. You heard the evidence that shortly after they had settled in America on, in June 2009, uh, the bank manager emailed them about Jamboree. Yes. And you saw the email that was on the screen before that came from the bank manager on the 26th of June 2009? Yes, I have seen that. And you heard that in that email, the bank manager told the Browers that Jamboree was for sale. He told them the size of the block. He estimated the price of the property to be four million. He estimated the number of breeders that could be run on the property and he offered to obtain more information about it for yes. them. Yes. Yes. Now, is that type of unsolicited contact from a bank manager about a potential real estate opportunity common in your experience? I don't know that it was entirely unsolicited, uh, but the answer is it varies depending on the manager and the level of proactivity that that manager undertakes. Um, from reviewing the file, I understand that, that Mr and Mrs Brower had expressed some interest in acquiring a property at some stage in the future. I don't know if the timing of that, um, as Ms Brower points out, uh, may not have been the correct timing, but I do understand from reviewing the file that it had been a uh, conversation on expansion. So at some point in the past, the Browers had expressed an interest in um, buying another property in the as future? The as the file would indicate. Yes, I see. Um, now. Is that sort of contact from a bank manager about a potential real estate opportunity uh, something that Rabobank would encourage its bank managers to do? It's not something that I would encourage, no. Why not? Uh, in this particular circumstance, um, 
I believe that it gave rise for some conflict between um, the three parties involved. All right, I want to come back to that conflict Sorry, between yeah. the three parties involved. But let's assume for now that there was no conflict. Okay. Um, What's the situation then? Is this something that Rabobank would encourage to have its bank managers send emails to its customers about potential real estate opportunities? I think it's something that we would do with caution. No, not, not in the general practice. I would not encourage it. And it why could, is that? Why would you not encourage it? It could go towards advice, and we're very much a non-advice model. I want to put to you that an email like this is sent because... It's the start of a process that might enable the bank to write a new loan with the client. That would be the outcome. Yes. Uh, and this bank manager and other bank managers at Rabobank had KPIs that required him to achieve financial results, didn't he? He does. Mm -hmm. And his KPIs required him to achieve a certain volume of gross lending and a certain volume of gross lending for rural loans. Yes, they do. They did? Yes, they did. Yes. yes. And could I ask you to look at a document which is RAL 0004-0188. Now, this is a performance appraisal form for the bank manager for the 2009 year? Yes. And we see on this page, uh, the second box down is financial management. Yes. These are the objectives uh, for the bank manager. So one of the objectives related to financial management. Yes. And we see the measures or KPIs in the fourth column across. Yes. Yes, it, uh, I'm sorry, it might be difficult to read on the screen. Perhaps we could... I, I can read it, I'm you, sorry. You can read it? Yeah, sorry. Uh, it's that second row. That's easier for the rest of us. Thank you. Um, now, uh, the KPIs for the financial management objective were, one, achieve gross lending for rural loans of $15 million dollars. Yes. And two, achieve net lending of $12 million. That's correct. So this bank manager who dealt with Mr and Mrs Brower had financial targets he had to meet of bringing in rural loans of $15 million a year. Yes, he did. So he was incentivised by the bank to try and find opportunities to set up loans. Yes. Uh, and that's what he was doing here, isn't it? Yes. And we see in this document that his mid-year achievement is recorded in the next column over. Uh, now that we have it blown up, we can't see the headings, but the column next to achieve gross lending to the right is a column headed mid-year achievement. Now his mid-year achievement records that for the first six months of 2009, they've been slower for him than past years and he was working hard to increase his new business contribution to the branch and to convert all opportunities. That's correct. But does Rabobank still set KPIs for its bank managers that have lending targets? Yes, we do. And why do you do that? Uh, because enable to, to enable us to grow our business through increased lending. Do you see any difficulties with that from a customer perspective, Mr James? Absolutely not. No difficulties? None whatsoever. Do you see any difficulties having heard the evidence of Mrs Brower about her experience? Um, I do understand uh, the difficulties that Mr and Mrs Brower experienced um, as a result of how those uh, actions may have come about. But in terms of us having uh, objectives for man managers to lend to increase the business, I have absolutely no problems with that whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So does Rabobank take some responsibility for creating a system that incentivises its bank managers to go out and sell as much volume of loans as they can so that they can meet their KPIs? If it was unqualified, I would have a problem with that, but it's not 
unqualified. In what way is it qualified, Mr James? We have a requirement for our managers to lend sustainably in terms of the risk uh, in those KPIs as well. Where do I see that here, Mr page. James? Zero one. Do, do you have... Uh, on the next page is 0189. I'll have that brought up on the screen. Did you want me to talk to that? Or? Yes, could you, could you just so, point out where in the document we see that? Okay, so under portfolio maintenance. Yes. Um, so the, the internal audit items, yes. uh, significant ones, issues, would relate to, could relate to, and would relate to quality of lending. Um, the items of um, reviews could also relate to quality of lending and ensuring that the quality of lending was being maintained. Mm -hmm. um, the items uh, of, there were several, but not all. Adherence to policy generally um, would refer to credit policies also, mm -hmm. where a manager is brought to account if they aren't lending in terms of the bank's credit policies. Uh, the BIS2 ratings refers to a, a metrics that the bank uses to look at the quality of a loan mm -hmm. uh, and they are to be maintained uh, as well uh, and the rest of it of, of that would not relate to uh, matters that I'm speaking to. So you have internal measures that could relate to the quality of the loan. Definitely. Is that right? Definitely. I see. But at the same time you incentivise your bank managers to go out and bring in as many loans as they can? Within the, within the confines of that Credit quality, yes. I see. I tend to this document, Commissioner. Uh, 2009 appraisal form, manager Dolby Branch, Rabo Bank, RAL, 0004, 0004, exhibit 4.35. Uh, Mr James, what's the consequence of meeting your KPIs? The consequence of meeting them? Mm. So we have, at that stage, uh, we had uh, a, a, what I would refer to, and the bank refers to as a discretionary bonus system. A bonus system. Uh, in line with um, a review of salary, um, what we refer to as TEC, total employment cost, uh, and that alignment of that salary is in terms also of the performance of a staff member, not just a manager. So if you met your KPIs, you were eligible for a bonus? That's correct. And if you didn't meet these lending targets, you wouldn't be eligible for your bonus? If you didn't, well, no, it's not just the lending targets. So if you if you met the lending targets and you didn't meet the the risk aspect of it, yes. you, you may not apply uh, achieve a lending target because it's it's assessed as as a total. But one element that you had to satisfy was meeting your lending targets. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. And if you didn't meet your lending targets, it didn't matter about the rest of it. You wouldn't be eligible for a bonus. No, that's not correct. Okay, because, could you explain that? I'm sorry. Because it's discretionary, we look at uh, the seasonal conditions that may exist at the time. Mm -hmm. So in any given year, we've had managers that have achieved a bonus who haven't met their lending targets because of um, uh, circumstances beyond their control. I it see. Is, it is rare that we would pay, and in my personal experience, would not pay a bonus to a manager who achieved those lending targets but did not achieve the risk targets. Yes. So the discretion is applied in a way that means where lending targets are not met because of seasonal conditions, recognition is given to that factor? Among other things. Yes, okay. Uh, now, when the bank manager sent the email to the Browers on the 26th of June 2009, he'd recently inspected Kaiora uh, for the purposes of conducting evaluation. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. He'd inspected Kaiora on the 19th of June 2009 and he produced a report, a valuation report on the 30th of July 2009. That's correct. So why was he doing a valuation of Kaiora a week before he sent this email to the Browers? Uh, that date, um, the coincidence of that date is not apparent to me. So why would he have been valuing Kaiora at that point in the bank's relationship with the Browers? Uh, they'd gone to the United States. Mm. They weren't seeking any additional facilities. Mm. What would have caused him to go and inspect Kaiora for the purposes of producing a valuation? I, I can't answer that. I'm sorry. If, if, can, do you want a circumstance of when that could exist? 
I don't know no, what the circumstance really was that did exist. I'm not sure. I'm sorry. You don't know why he did that. No, I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Now, uh, you saw the email sent by Mrs Brower in response to the bank manager's email on the 29th of June 2009. Yes, I did. Uh, and you've seen the bank manager's response to that on the 30th of June 2009. Yes, I did. And you saw that he referred in that email to his discussions with Mr Wright, uh, um, who owned a property that shared a boundary with Jamboree and who was interested in purchasing part of Jamboree. Yes. And you saw in that email that he set out what he understood the vendor's price expectations would be as well. Yes, I did. Uh, now, uh, he estimated in that email the purchase price for the available portion of land uh, and told Mrs Brower that there were a number of other interested parties in the property. Yes, he did. Uh, now, again, I, I just want to understand if that's the sort of email that Rabobank would encourage its bank managers to send to its clients. Not given the parties involved. Well, again, I want to come to this issue of understand. conflict that I think is underpinning some of your answers, but I firstly want to understand whether Rabobank's position is that a relationship manager, a bank manager, should be inserting himself uh, in a potential purchase of property in this way. It is something that I would encourage our managers to exercise caution with. So um, it's not something that I would do. So it should not have been done by this bank manager? There is not a hard and fast rule on it. It's one of discretion. Yes, and uh, you, you've looked at this file. Should this bank manager have done it in this situation? In this circumstance, no. OK. Now, we've, you've referred to the conflict a number of times. I'm sorry. That, no, 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 I want to come to that now. The bank manager wasn't just assisting the Browers with this potential purchase, was he? No, he wasn't. He was also assisting the Wrights, the people who were interested in purchasing the other portion of land? That's correct. So the Wrights were also his clients? Um, not at that point. Whose clients were they at that point? I'm not sure. I'm, of, of Rabobank I'm referring. So I'm not sure that they were they, they clients. Were, they were Rabobank clients, is that what you're saying? I'm saying I'm not sure that the rights were Rabobank clients at that time. Right. The, the people who acquired the property. So were they prospective clients? Yes, yes. All right. They were clients that the bank manager was looking to bring across. Is that right? That's correct. OK. Uh, and Tom Campbell, the vendor of the property, he was also a client of Rabobank? He was a client. Uh, and was Tom Campbell one of the bank manager's clients? Yes, he was. Right. So of the three parties to this potential transaction, the bank manager was representing the Browers, he was trying to represent the Wrights, and he was also representing the Campbells. That's correct. Can I qualify something I've just yes. said? Clarify something I've just said? Yes. I think the ultimate acquirers of the property, their parents were clients of the bank. I see. And I believe that the children had bought the property, but I'm not sure that the children at that time, yes. not they weren't children, I'm sorry, the adult children were clients. So Paul Just and Marina, who we saw referred to in some of the emails. I believe they're the parents. They're the parents. I believe they were clients. And they were clients yes. of the bank manager. Yes. And they were purchasing the property for their son and his wife. I don't think they were purchasing it for them. I think they actually, the, the, the son and the wife purchased it themselves. Uh, so the parents were assisting in the purchase. I understand that, so. Yes. yes. Yes, I see. I just wanted to clarify that. So yeah. the bank managers involved <laughs> for every party in the transaction, was that an acceptable position? No. Why not? It gives rise for conflict. Mm -hmm. It was a potential conflict of interest, wasn't it? I believe so. And what did Rabobank's policies at that time say about the handling of that sort of situation? The policies at the time were, were broad. Um, there was uh, a, a general policy on those uh, conflicts being reported to the manager of, of the conflicted person. You say that the policy at the time was to report it to the manager? Correct. All right. Now, could I show you a document which is RAL 0005 0007 Now, is this uh, Rabobank's policy about uh, conflicts of interest at the time? I don't have a date 
uh, on that document, I'm sorry. Could, could I show you uh, at page 0164? <coughs> yes, that November it, 2006. It's dated November 2006. And if we turn to 0178, we see that section 9 in the document deals with conflicts of interest and duty. You see that? I can. You see towards the bottom of the page there are three main categories of conflicts, examples of which are as follows. Conflicts of duty between two or more customers, where transactions are being arranged between two or more customers, the bank must ensure that all parties are being treated evenly and appropriate disclosures are made. And when the bank wishes to advise on both sides of a tr transaction or on behalf of two different parties on the same transaction, for this to be able to occur, generally express written consent with full disclosure must be obtained from those parties. That's correct. Did that happen here? No, it didn't. Why not? I believe it was overlooked. Overlooked? Well, that's the only reason I could give. And now, are you able to point to any part of this document, which I think you've been provided with prior to giving evidence today, um, that establishes that there was any system at this time for reporting a potential conflict up the line? Uh, without reviewing the entire document, um, my understanding of the policy in 2006 was that the, the item should be referred to the account manager's manager. Um, and then ultimately reported through to compliance uh, in Sydney, uh, in, in our head office. Well, I, I can oh. see no reference to that in yeah, this document. That was my understanding, Mr. I'm sorry, James. but I haven't seen that in this document here. No. Yeah. So it's not in that document? Not that I can see in front of me, no. Okay. Can I just object in relation to the fairness aspect of that question. Um, there is potential material in there to which the witness hasn't been directed. Um, and it asked, I thought about whether there was anything in this document that spoke to it, and I thought his answer was no. And I thought the, uh, the follow-up question was that I can see nothing in this document that does refer to, to that. Okay. Um, and as a matter of fairness, I think it should be put to the witness, uh, not in those terms, if in fact there is material. You've lost me. Sorry. Um, uh, the... I go back a stage. I'm, I'm obviously playing a lap behind the uh, where the game is. So it's unfair because a uh, an assertion has been made that there is nothing in that document that does in fact refer to a reference of a conflict to a manager or a compliance. And I thought the witness had agreed with that. Am I wrong in that for a start? The witness had agreed to it, yes. Right, so where's the unfairness? In making the further assertion that I can see nothing in, you, I can see nothing in that document. The, the question was, I can see nothing in that document that does refer to that. So that doesn't depend on the witness's answer at all. It is a further independent assess, uh, assessment made by the Questioner. The, the document will speak for itself, I yes. think, quite it, Mr McGrath. Yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, go on, Ms Hall. I'll tender the document, Commission, which will allow submissions to be made about whether there is a part of the document. I understand the witness is not able to identify a part, but um, if his counsel are able to... 4.36, Rabobank Worldwide Compliance Standards, November 06, RAL 0005, 0007, 0162. Now, Mr James, what do Rabobank's current policies require in this sort of situation? Current policies are a lot clearer. Yes. Um, and more concise. Yes. Um, so we have a, a, a far more steely focus on compliance of, of matters of conflict. Um, the current policy is, is clear in that if a conflicted person, staff member, um, uh, identifies a situation where they uh, may be conflicted, that that is reported to their account manager. Uh, their account manager um, will report that to the uh, what we call our risk champions, mm -hmm. and in our region that is a risk and compliance officer with a dedicated role. A further assessment is done, and then it is reported through to our compliance department in Sydney and maintained in a register. Now, you've exhibited 
uh, the current conflicts policy to your statement as Exhibit 57, RAL 0005 0060763. I just want to ask you about one part of that document, Mr James, mm. at 0774. Under the heading disclosure of a conflict to a client or third party, if we could have that blown up. We see in exceptional circumstances and with the prior approval of compliance and legal, it may be appropriate to disclose a conflict of interest to a client or third party as a proactive management tool. Yes. So I just want to understand what constitute the exceptional circumstances that permit disclosure of a conflict to a client? I'll just read that again if you don't mind. Yes. So in exceptional circumstances, prior approval of compliance. I think what that is saying, my interpretation, of that is it's saying that with the express approval of the client, if we've identified a conflict and the client is, is cognizant of that conflict and comfortable with it, that we can proceed, providing we've got oversight from legal and compliance. Well, I think this is more about whether the client is told Absolutely. of the conflict. So I'm sorry, I'm struggling to understand your answer. If the client is comfortable with the conflict. If the client has been informed. Well, this is about the circumstances in which the client is permitted to be informed. saying that it is appropriate to disclose a conflict of interest to a client. In exceptional circumstances. Yeah, I understand, yeah. Uh, so I just want to understand That's what... That's a little different from what I said, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, so w why is it only exceptional circumstances that would permit disclosure of a conflict of interest to a client? I'm trying to, I'm trying to understand what would give rise to an exceptional circumstance. Yes. Um, and, and I'm wondering if that applies in discretionary. As a, as, a, as a discretionary line. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what ex exceptional circumstance would exist for that to happen. So generally, does that mean generally the position is that the conflict is not disclosed to the client? Uh, oh, I see. Um, I, would, I would think so, particularly if the conflict... Yes, I would think so, particularly... If it would not be disclosed? If it would not be disclosed. So do you mind if I give the example of this circumstance? Yes. For my interpretation? I would, I would think that if, if, if a manager identified something that could potentially be a conflict and didn't proceed with that transaction and reported it through the appropriate channel and, and removed themselves from that transaction, there then wouldn't need to be disclosure to the client because there's no consequence, because the conflict's been resolved or the conflict didn't exist because they've been removed from the transaction. Mm -hmm. A further example? Well, yes, I'm still struggling to reconcile that with the direction given to employees by this statement uh, because I read this statement, and you can tell me if you disagree with Please. my reading of it, yeah. to suggest that your bank managers are only allowed to tell their clients about a potential conflict of interest in exceptional circumstances oh, and when they've got the approval of compliance and legal to do so. Yeah, I see. I, I see what you're saying. It's it's not it's not. I believe. I don't believe that's how it's intended. I see. The intention of the policy is to not have our managers conflicted. If they are, that it's reported beforehand, uh, and if it's appropriate to proceed, that the, that that should be disclosed with with the client. That's my interpretation. And do you do you accept that that's not? That's a little the way ambiguous. This works, the, that the way this sentence works. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. I'm, okay. I'm explaining my understanding of the intention of the policy. I so, see. And I, but I do understand your reference there. I'm not clear. Yes, if that's the intention, do you accept that that's not consistent with the way the policy is expressed? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, now, can I take you back into the chronology of the Browers? Uh, and we had been in July 2009 with these email exchanges that were passing between the bank manager and the Browers while they were in America. Uh, and um, we saw that there was an email earlier where the banker told the Browers that he'd spoken um, with Mr Wright uh, 
uh, and there's a conversation about uh, Mr Brower coming back to Australia to look at the property. Do you recall that? Yes, that's that? correct. Yes, yes. I've read that. Now, on the 19th of July 2009, the relationship manager, the bank manager, inspected Jamboree for the purpose of conducting evaluation. Is that right? That's correct. Now, uh, could I ask you to look at RAL 0002 Now, uh, is this the valuation report that the bank manager produced for Jamboree on the 19th of July 2009? I'm sorry, uh, the inspection is on the 19th of July 2009 and if we have page 2806 brought up, we'll see that the valuation date is the 30th of July 2009. Yes. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Um, so this is the re valuation report produced by the bank manager. That's correct. And we see at 2806 on the screen at the moment that the bank manager valued Jamboree at $2.9 million. That's correct. Now, was it usual for the bank manager who was responsible for writing the loan to conduct the valuation of the property that was under consideration for the loan? At that time, it was. And at that time, in what circumstances were bank managers permitted to conduct valuations in respect of security properties for their loans? So, uh, recalling the policy at that time, uh, for amounts under for loans under a million dollars, uh, they could value, inspect, and value the property for internal purposes. For amounts over that, they needed the co-signature of a senior manager known at the time as a C signatory or their branch manager. All right. I want to have a look at the policy that embodies what you've just described. But before I do that, I tender the valuation report, Commissioner. Uh, exhibit 4.37 is Property Inspection Valuation Report, Jamboree, 30 July 09, RAL 0002 I'll take you to RAL 0004-0002-0015. Which is the Rabobank valuation policy as at the 19th of February 2007, uh, so applicable at this this time. And do you see there the heading internal valuations? Yes, I do. And clause point one point one tells us that Rabobank's position was that where valuation reports are completed internally, they're undertaken by account managers. Such valuations are for the bank's use only and must not be released to any other party unless authorised by legal. Yes. Now, just pausing there, wh why not release the valuation reports to the client? Uh, our valuations are in, for internal purposes to value the uh, extent of um, values, valuations on collateral. Uh, and they're conducted by account managers who aren't necessarily valuers for external purposes. Who aren't necessarily? Valuers. So the person conducting the valuation is not necessarily a valuer? No. W what are their qualifications to conduct valuations? For internal assessment purposes at that time, uh, the training was um, incorporated in credit training of a general nature. No specific training course set aside valuations. So how did you expect them to have the necessary skills to conduct property valuations? Yeah, so uh, which is why our policy at that time uh, looked for the oversight and sign off by an experienced manager um, to double check the valuation but that the had been adopted. The person with the oversight wasn't a valuer either, were they Mr no, James? No, they weren't. No. So that didn't help much? Well it does because that person, uh, as I mentioned earlier, was a C signatory who was a senior person within the bank who had uh, uh, years of experience to ensure that they had uh, sufficient experience to oversight that uh, valuation. Years of experience of valuing properties? Of banking. Right. Okay. So if we turn to clause 1.3, we see that valuations for residential securities where the value is one million or less 
may be undertaken by the account manager subject to what you've already referred to, C, signatory endorsement. Where the value is in excess of one million, the valuation is to be referred to an external valuer. Now, um, was Jamboree a residential security? No, it wasn't. Right. So uh, this clause didn't apply? No, it didn't. And then we see clause 1.4. Unless otherwise agreed by credit, all security properties must be inspected, the inspection report and valuation in the CMS completed and submitted to credit with commentary and recommendation in the following situations. For all new loans, irrespective of amount, and for loan increases in excess of $1 million. That's correct. So does that mean that for non-residential security properties, um, they Double zero two, double zero one five. Now, around this time, uh, in uh, uh, 2007, I'm sorry, in 2009, the policy is 2007, the events we're talking about are in 2009. So around that time, I want to put to you that issues with Rabobank's approach to valuations were emerging. Do you agree with that? Yes. And. APRA had required Rabobank to review its rural valuation policy to clarify and tighten requirements regarding internal valuations? Yes. And Rabobank had agreed to do that and said that it would introduce control measures by late 2010? That's correct. And then in 2011, in an internal audit report, Rabobank identified a number of deficiencies with its internal valuation processes, uh, including deficiencies in the way the valuations were being completed. That's correct. And later in 2011, APRA conducted a targeted review of collateral and foreclosure management, and Rabobank was one of 13 banks who participated in that review. That's correct. And Ernst and Young conducted the assessment for Rabobank. That's correct. And they produced a report. I understand, sir. Yes. Well, I'll show you that report. It's RAL 0005 0005 So this is a copy of the report produced by Ernst & Young for the APRA targeted review of collateral and foreclosure management. Yes. Yes. And if we turn to 0092, um, we see a summary of um, results of this work and about halfway down the page we see that the report dealt with um, the extent, do you see that? The extent to which collateral management systems and processes are independent of the business origination function yes, and independently reviewed by the risk management and internal audit functions. Yes, I see that. And we see that was given um, a, an orange rating, do you see that? Yes, I do. And if we turn to the page before, 0091, we see that orange is suggested improvement opportunities. Yes. 
Now, I, I want to deal a bit more with the content of this report, but it's usefully summarised in another document, which I'll take you to. So I'll tender the report. Uh, exhibit 4.39 EY report, AMPRA targeted review, 30 journal 11 RAL 0005 0005 0085. And can I take you now to RAL 0005 0005 0308? And we see that this is a letter uh, from APRA to Rabobank, uh, dated the 2nd of December 2011. Yes. And we see in the first paragraph that um, there's reference to the review involving uh, external auditors uh, assessing Rabobank's compliance. I'm sorry, you'll see this reference further down the page for the 2010 to 2011 targeted review. Do you see that paragraph? Yes, I do. External auditors were required to assess the strengths and weaknesses of the ADI's compliance with relevant prudential standards, collateral management governance framework, collateral management systems and reporting, valuation processes, custodial arrangements and foreclosure management. We see that 13 banks participated in the review. Yes. Now, if we turn to 0311, we see some findings that Ernst & Young made summarised in this document. Finding 8, if we could blow up finding 8 and the, two par the three paragraphs underneath it, valuations performed by the originator. Ernst & Young have noted that in the majority of cases, the loan originator also values the collateral. And although the loan is reviewed every three years, the valuation is updated by the same individual. It is perceived that in this regard, collateral management systems are not independent of the business origination function. There is a risk the collateral may be overvalued by the originator, either intentionally or in error. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Uh, now, APRA asked Rabobank, you see in the third paragraph there, to provide details on the policy or procedural changes that had been made to now ensure that there was sufficient independence between the collateral valuation process and the credit origination function. Yes. I tender that letter, Commissioner. Exhibit 4.40, letter 2 December 2011, APRA to Rabobank, RAL 0005-0005-0308. So that letter was the 2nd of December to Rabobank, 2nd of December 2011. Can I take you to a letter from Rabobank to APRA dated the 16th of December 2011? RAL 0005-0005-0056. Yes. Do you see there under the heading Finding 8, if we could blow that up, that Rabobank told APRA that it was cognizant of the significance of accurate valuations and has implemented a range of additional controls during 2011 to ensure an appropriate balance is maintained between collateral risk and business considerations. Uh, and Rabobank referred to the release of an updated valuation policy. Yes. And that updated policy still permitted loan originators to value a property at the time of origination, didn't it? Yes, it did. And it still permitted the, or did it still permit, uh, the loan originator to conduct the subsequent reviews of that valuation? Yes, it did. Okay. So there remained a lack of independence between the collateral valuation process and the credit origination function? Yes, it did. And the bank came back to look at that issue in 2014. I'll take you to that, but I'll tender this letter. Exhibit 4.41 letter. Uh, 16 December 11, Rabobank to APRA, RAL 0005-0005-0056. Yes, Mr James. Sorry. Um, 
There was one other recommendation in there that did make a difference to the oversight on valuations that yes. wasn't mentioned. Is it appropriate I mention Yes, I'm that? happy for you to mention that, Mr James. Thank you. Um, so as part of that recommendation, it was decided that we would have uh, a head of valuations appointed to the role of doing hindsight valuations. Um, that was after the event, I appreciate. Yes. Uh, but it was certainly something in there that acted as a further mitigant to the concerns that you've raised. Okay. But still the originators were performing the valuations. Yes. Yes. Uh, now, as I uh, said, I um, understand that the bank came back to look at this issue in 2014 and the trigger for that was the release of draft regulations from the European Central Bank. Is that right? Yes, it was. Uh, can I take you to RAL 0005 0041? This is an internal memo at Rabobank dated the 22nd of July 2014. Do you see under the heading background if we could have that blown up? <coughs> that there is reference there to draft regulations from the European Central Bank and following those draft regulations, a group-wide policy in respect to the monitoring of collateral has been issued. Whilst neither APRA or the RBNZ are yet to adopt similar regulation, it appears possible, brackets probable, local regulators will adopt similar measures in the future. To comply with the regulations, the following policy setting has been established for all Rabobank entities. When real estate is part of the collateral base, the value should be properly assessed before granting the credit. An independent, qualified appraisal of the market value is required. Independent in this context means independent from the client and from the commercial department that maintains the relationship with the client. Yes. Uh, and we see a reference further down to the current model, which was that account managers prepared valuations for non-specialist rural land. Uh, and we see within that paragraph a few lines down, the advantage of this model is that account managers are well versed in land values in their regions and this expertise and knowledge is highly valued by our client base. The disadvantage is that the appraisal is not independent of the front office and it could be perceived and is possible that account managers are inflating values to assist in the provision of credit to clients that the second line of defence lacks intimacy with the property and the local market exacerbates the risk. To date, empirical evidence, actual sales compared to the RAGNZ appraisal, support the conservatism of our appraisals. That was my experience also. Thank you. I tender that document, Commissioner. Exhibit 4.42, Nemo, 22 July 14, to Executive Committee, Rabobank. RAL 0005 0003 0041. Uh, and following this, in response to these European Central Bank regulations, Rabobank created the Asset Quality Management Department. Yes, we did. And that's a separate operating unit of your risk division uh, that is established, um, we see from documents because of changes to the regulatory environment that require a separation of the property appraisal and collateral <coughs> inspection function from the credit approval function. Yes. Is that right? That's correct. Um, so Rabobank moved to a new model which no longer permits loan originators to conduct valuations. That's correct. So valuations are now conducted only by um, internal appraisers or by external valuers? That's correct. So what's an internal appraiser? So the asset quality team, asset quality management team, uh, employs um, managers who were um, seconded across to that division to attend to the valuations of all properties that we hold as collateral. And what are their qualifications? Uh, they vary. Um, they, they are typically experienced bankers, not all. Uh, in fact, most wouldn't be valuers. It's headed by someone and oversighted by somebody who was a registered valuer. So they're typically experienced bankers 
and you said they're oversighted by a person who's a valuer. That's correct. So yes. they aren't valuers either? No. All right. So when was the change to that model made? Uh, 2000, 2015, to the best of my recollection. 2015. So Rabobank, from the documents that I've just taken you through, was on notice of problems with its valuation model from at least 2009 when concerns were raised by APRA. That's correct. Um, and it was on notice of APRA's view that it needed to ensure sufficient independence between the collateral valuation process and the credit origination function since at least 2011. That's correct. But it didn't implement changes that prevented bank managers from conducting valuations for their loans until 2015? Those changes were impacted, in, in fact, uh, or rather, uh, yeah, in, in 2015, correct. Was that acceptable, that it took so long to deal with those issues, Mr James? I think in the context of the, uh, the problem as it existed from an internal point of view, of whether or not we had a significant problem with properties being valued inaccurately. Um, I don't think it was. In terms of our um, speed to delivery of the requirements, uh, it probably wasn't. And your internal appraisers are still not valuers? No, no. They're not valuers, but we do have far more rigorous internal training, we saw, specifically in that regard. But not valuation training? On, centred on valuations. Right. But they, I just want to be clear, I want to make sure I understand this, they are not qualified valuers. They are not all qualified valuers, all no, right. to be clear. Now, APRA conducted a review in relation to Rabobank's processes last year, didn't it? Yes. And APRA identified continuing issues with valuations at Rabobank? Yes. Okay. Could we have a look at RAL 0005 0003 0072? This is a letter from APRA to Rabobank on the 10th of November last year and it, it relates to a review of Rabobank that APRA conducted in September last year. Yes. And if we turn to 0074, we see that there were three key findings from the review and the third of those related to the valuation policy. We could blow that up. See, APRA is aware that Rabobank has recently undertaken a review of its valuation policy. APRA supports this review, noting that there appears to have been weaknesses in Rabobank's valuation policy over the review period. Valuation concerns was a recurring theme in the problem loan files reviewed. Rabobank also reported a very high rate of overrides against its loan to security ratio policy. Can you explain that policy, Mr James? So the loan to security valuation uh, ratio policy relates to a, uh, a lending value ratio, which is a percentage portion of the total assumed market value of a property, uh, and it's within our policy. Um, and in the, in the case of a grazing enterprise, that lending value ratio may be 50%, and the override would relate to an instance where we approved a loan where that lending value ratio was at, say, 55% or in excess of the 50%. So APRA noted that you had a very high rate of those overrides at Rabobank? That's correct. I see. Uh, now, APRA uh, made some observations at 0075 of this document about the need for Rabobank to improve its lessons learned process. Can you explain what that lessons learned process is? So uh, lessons learned process revolves hindsight reviews of outcomes from various, uh, in this case, uh, valuations um, or certain circumstances that have evolved to see, ensure that we look back in hindsight to ensure that we've acted appropriately mm. or take our learnings away from it to correct going forward. And we see there that APRA said that as part of its review it had examined six lessons learned memos prepared by Rabobank over the period since March 2015. Yes. 
and its assessment was that there remained scope for improvement. Yes, I've read that. There were inadequate action points in response to identified weaknesses in origination practices. So are you referring to the... To the so there was, there was two locks of six um, lessons learned. There were one that had six files and there was one that had six uh, valuation assessments. Are we talking about the valuation oh. assessments? No, I'm referring to the six lessons learned memos that were prepared by Rabobank. There's a footnote in this document that shows you what they are. Footnote two, if you look at it, tells you which matters those lessons learned memos related to. Could I please have a moment to read that? Yes. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And APRA noted, can you see in that paragraph, that there were inadequate action points in response to the weaknesses that were identified in those lessons learned processes? Yes. And that across all of the reviews, there was little evidence of recommendations for changes to lending policies or practices, risk appetite or staff training? Mm, yes, I see. And APRA also noted that there were several recurring issues in the lessons learned reviews, including valuation issues. That's correct. Uh, and APRA requested, we see at 0076, that by the 30th of March this year, Rabobank provide a copy of its review of valuations. Uh, this is the last paragraph. And in that response, clearly outline how this review addresses the issues that were identified in the six lessons learned memos and how any changes to policy or practices may impact LSR overrides. I tender that document, Commissioner. 4.43, letter 10 November 17, APRA to Rabo Bank Re Prudential Review Report, RAL 0005 0003 0072. There was a change, Ms Orr, to our um, to our policy in regards to that. In response to this? Yes. Yes, I just want to take you to <coughs> that you. now. Thank so uh, can I take you to the letter that Rabobank sent to APRA in response to this one, uh, which is RAL 0005 0003 0078. So this is your letter back to APRA on the 28th of November last year. And if we turn to the second page, 0079, we see that Rabobank told APRA that it had established a new independent asset management team. Is that what you were referring to, Mr James? In part. And a new framework around valuations, which is independent of the first line and the second line. Yes. Is that what you were referring to? In part. Uh, there's also a reference to a new valuation of real estate policy which prescribed, among other things, that only internal appraisers could perform internal appraisals. Th those were the things that you told APRA about. Is there something else you want to tell the Commission about? Only in relation to the last um, sentence in the final paragraph on page one. In, in regards um, to... I'm sorry, do, uh, do go on, finish your sentence. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, you finish your answer. Um, uh, in, in relation to the LSR, we reviewed that very carefully. I see. Because of the exceptions that were within our 50% LSR policy. I see. The we overrides. Looked, yes. 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 And what did you do in response to that? Um, we looked at the occurrence of um, LSRs that were outside of that policy and, and, and whether or not um, it was prudent to bring them to back within policy or whether or not there was sufficient cash flow in those businesses to be able to sustain higher LSRs. This, this largely relates to strengthening of cash flows. So the decision was made by the bank to review the LSR policy. Uh, and, and we did, and in the instance of the cattle sector, for argument's sake, it's been increased to 60%. I see. But with a lower tolerance to overrides. Yes, I see. Now, could I tender this letter um, to APRA? Uh, letter 28 November 17, Rabobank to APRA, RAL 0005 0003 0078, Exhibit 4.44. Now, I, I want to come back to the Browers and their circumstances, but there's one last document on these topics that I uh, want to show to you before I do that, uh, Mr James, which is an exhibit to your statement. It's Exhibit 51, 
which is your current valuation policy, yes. RAL 0005 0006-0340. This is the current policy, Mr. James. February 2018. Yes, it is. Now, um, if we turn to 0344, we see the types of uh, appraisals that an internal appraiser can now do. You see there they can do uh, a desktop appraisal which doesn't involve a physical inspection of the property. That's correct. A joint appraisal, which is based on an inspection that's carried out by the account manager and the value adoption by the internal appraiser. Yes. And a full appraisal, uh, which is where the inspection and the value adoption are carried out by the internal appraiser. That's correct. So what are the circumstances in which a desktop appraisal of an agricultural property are carried out? Uh, so they are triggered by amounts of exposure that a client would have with us. Uh, and typically a desktop valuation in, in, in the first instance would uh, adopt a value of general figure um, where the loan security ratio as a result of adopting that conservative figure exceeds 70%. Um, we would then look to source two comparable sales and, and, and apply that valuation uh, to that property. And what are the circumstances where a joint appraisal with the physical inspection being the account managers and then the value adoption happening um, by the internal appraiser? So that is exposure triggered as well. So above a million dollars, and I'm just trying to recall the, the, the top end it will be in our policy here. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe it's 16 million, but I'll, I'll need to refer to the policy, please. Um, I'm sorry, it may be eight million. I'm sorry. You're correct. It's sixteen million. Yes. Okay. Uh, zero three four five. Recently changed. So in that instance, um, we have the uh, account manager inspect the property, uh, and the valuation, as always, is applied by the internal appraiser. What does it mean to say that the value is adopted by the internal appraiser following the inspection by the account manager? Um, so. So in, in the, the um, process of evaluating a property, it's obviously done on following an inspection uh, to assume, to assess what the, the nature of the country is, or the productive capacity of the property is, uh, and, and from that we assume a value compared to peer properties. And the peer properties are comparable sales of other places that have sold uh, in that district ideally. And the valuer, the internal appraisal staff member, actually applies the valuation figure based on the assessment that the manager, rather based on the inspection, I should say, that the manager has done in the field. So does the account manager provide a figure that is adopted? No, the account no. manager never provides a figure. So, so where does the figure come from? The, the figure comes from the uh, review of the inspection and the comparable data that's put together by the... Um, and that comparable data is critically assessed and, and, and looked over very carefully for aberrations that may appear uh, where a sale has been of an extraordinarily high or low figure for a certain reason. And what are the circumstances where a full appraisal um, uh, of an agricultural property is done? And the trigger amount again, I'll, I'll need to verify because oh, it's recently changed. 0345, if we can um, bring it up to the screen, on the screen, I think suggests that it's in excess of 16 million. In excess of 16 million um, is a, a full appraisal uh, and, and that on that assessment, do you mind if we go if we go down one page for four point three, please? Uh, to the following page, yes, the page please. after this, zero three four six. Uh, so that is when um, that is when the uh, internal uh, uh, appraisal manager. Uh, actually attends the property and undertakes the inspection. Mm. And that can be done with or without the account manager. And the policy contains a process for dealing with disagreement by the account manager with the internal appraisal, doesn't it? Yes, it does. So the account manager is permitted to provide the internal appraisal 
internal appraiser with additional data to support an increase of the adopted property value. Is that right? If they believe, yes it is, yes, if they believe the figure is too low. Yeah. And if the value remains the same after they've done that, it goes to the appraiser's manager for review? In the asset quality management team, yes. And if the account manager is still dissatisfied, it can go to the senior manager of quality assurance for review? That's correct. So the relationship managers don't conduct the valuations anymore? In no circumstance. But they remain heavily involved in the valuation process? Very importantly. They do the inspection of the property for the joint appraisals? Yes. And they can dispute the valuation of the internal appraiser? Through the internal appraisal stream, correct. Okay, thank you. All right, now, I want to return to the Browers, yes. uh, Mr. James, uh, and we had left the Browers story at the point where the bank manager had inspected Jamboree for the purposes of evaluation on the 19th of July 2009, and he'd valued it at $2.1 million. Do you recall that? At $2.1 million? Uh, yes, that's my note, but Mr Costello doesn't will check that I've got that right. Yeah, the figure doesn't reconcile with me, I'm sorry. What's sorry. the figure that you recall? Are you referring to Jamboree? Jamboree. $2.9 uh, million. $2.9. All right, I'll double check that, but we'll move on and I'll come back if I need to correct that. Now, at the same time that uh, Mr... Uh, at the same time that the bank manager was valuing the portion of Jamboree that he was discussing with the Browers, he was also valuing the portion of Jamboree that he was discussing with the Wrights. That's correct. Um, now, uh, if I could show you, uh, and can I say before I show you the next document, you are correct, 2.9 million, I apologise for misleading you, um, was the valuation um, assigned by the bank manager for the Browers portion of Jamboree. Yes. Could I show you now RAL 0000064 Now this is the valuation report produced by the bank manager uh, which you'll see from page 0064 is dated the 29th of July 2009 that he produced for the other part of Jamboree that he was discussing with the rights. Yes. And you can see here that uh, the bank manager valued that portion of the property at $1.1 million. That's correct. So with the $1.1 million valuation for the portion uh, that the rights were looking at, and the $2.9 million valuation for the portion that the Browers were looking at, he valued Jamboree in total at $4 million. That's correct. And that was precisely the figure that he told Mrs Brower in his email on the 26th of June as the price that he thought um, the property would go for. That's correct. That was the price that he thought Mr Campbell, another client of his, uh, would want for the property. That's correct. All right. Now, there were uh, further email exchanges between Mrs Brower and the bank manager in July 2009 uh, about um, the structure of any facility and the ability of the Browers to service that facility. Do you recall one of the emails that I took Mrs Brower to in her evidence? Yes, could you please refer to it again? Yes. Now, uh, Exhibit 29 to your statement <coughs> RAL 0002 is a copy of the email exchange um, on the 22nd and 23rd of July. Do you see there 
22nd of July, thank you. Do you see there the email that I took Mrs Brower through earlier today? Yes. Where the bank manager refers to the existing limits of 1.2 million with an increase of 3 million, taking the total limits to 4.2? Yes. You see the discussion about interest rates? Yes. Uh, the bank managers calculated that the total annual interest payable is 315,000. Yes. You see the reference to income, the two leases and the income that they would generate, which was $370,000 a year. Yes. And you see the analysis that the bank managers done of expenses and of available funds for the Browers. Yes. Uh, now, can I ask you to look at uh, RAL 0002003 We see that this is a further email sent by the bank manager to the Browers on the 23rd of July 2009 in a similar form to the previous email. Yes. Again, proposing a loan of 4.2. And you see a response here by the bank manager to a question from Mrs Brower about the farm management deposits. Uh, so about halfway down, do we have to cash these in? It's probably better if we can leave this alone so that we have some cash to do some work with. Yes. And here we see the bank manager's response. Don't really need to cash these in. Just thought you might want to pay the stamp duty and keep the additional loan down as much as possible. I tender that document, Commissioner. Before we deal with that, is the property inspection uh, report of 29 July 09 to go in or not? I'm sorry, it is to go in. I apologise if uh, well, I didn't exhibit 4.45. So 4.45 is property inspection and valuation report. 29 July 2009, RAL 0005-0004-0061. Exhibit 4.46 will be emailed to Browers 23 July 09, RAL 0002-0003-3213. Thank you, Commissioner. Now, these emails we've been looking at are from July 2009. And in September 2009, the bank manager prepared a credit submission for the proposed loan to the Browers to purchase Jamboree. Yes. Uh, and credit submissions at Rabobank seem to be divided into two parts, part A and part B. Is that right? That's correct. What goes in each part? Uh, in the part A is a summary of the advance and how much funding is required, uh, interest rates, loan grade and, and uh, collateral offered. And in part B, is the detailed explanation of the funding requirement, uh, cash flow analysis, risks, mitigants. So you've annexed part B of the credit submission to your statement as Exhibit 31. That's RAL 0002 0013556. That's correct. And I just want to take you through the bank manager's credit submission. So this was a submission, as I understand it, the frontline person, the bank manager, needs to make a submission to the credit department for approval of the facility. Is that right? That's correct. And that's what this is for the Browers? Yes, it is. And we see uh, at 3556, uh, about four paragraphs down, that the bank manager says this is a well-managed facility with nil history of excess or TLI requirement. What's TLI requirement? Temporary limit increase. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in the next paragraph he says, um, the applicants are looking to purchase a portion of the property Jamboree, located at a particular location. Property is currently owned by a previous client of the bank, THG Campbell, who currently retains a standalone EF facility with the bank. Correct. An EF facility? Equipment finance. I see. Vehicle, a tractor. Yes, I see. And at the last paragraph of the page we see... Clients have been looking to add a breeder property to the existing operation for some time. Whilst the timing is not optimal, the location within easy distance of Kaiora and existing relationship with one of the neighbouring property owners and previous owner of the property makes this an excellent opportunity. See that? I do. Okay. And then if we turn to 3557, 
we see that the first paragraph there explains that the Browers have moved to the United States. Yes. And it also explains that the existing property, Kaiora, is leased to the Simmons family of Theodore, whom have been a strong target for the branch for some time. This relationship may provide us with a foot in the door to that business. Branch and Sydney hold a copy of the lease agreement and it has previously been perused by legal. Yes. So in what way would the fact that the Browers were leasing Kaiora to the Simmons give Rabobank a foot in the door with the Simmons business? I'm not sure. Not I, sure what that means? I don't have a clear answer to that. I don't know what he was thinking when he wrote that, so I'm unsure. I see. It, 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 if I could suppose. Yes. Um, it, it, it may be that he becomes familiar with them through a property inspection or something of the like. That would be the only thing that I could understand that to me. Because he's got his KPIs and he's always looking for loan opportunities. Yes, is that he right? Is. That's yes. correct. Then at 355, further down the page, we see the proposal, which is in effect to retain the existing uh, uh, $1 million and $200,000 facility. Um, and to refinance the $1 million facility into the trust name and further funds to allow for the settlement of purchase of part Jamboree for $3 million and therefore a new facility with a limit of um, $4 million. That's correct. So $4 million plus the existing $200,000 facility. That's correct. We see further down the page under the heading personal factor and ability Applicant's family has owned the property Kaiora for three generations. Yes. And over the page, under the heading Property and Production, at 3558, we see the bank owner's um, description of um, the production on the property, the future direction of the property, the capacity of the property, and down the bottom, the properties are approximately 80 kilometres apart and would appear to constitute an excellent mix of breeding and fattening production capacity. Yes. Over the page at 3559, we see the assets and liabilities balance sheet at the top of the page. Uh, we see the list of assets and liabilities as at the 31st of August and then post-purchase of Jamboree. Yes. So pre-purchase, gearing of 24%. So that's a, a very modest level of gearing. Yes, it is. Moving to a still modest level of gearing of 44%. I wouldn't consider 44% modest. You wouldn't? Not, not, not modest, no. It's, right. it's not unacceptable, but I wouldn't consider it modest. OK, I understand. Now, there's then consideration later down this page of the historic trading figures. Just wait till you're able to see that, Mr James. And if we go over the page to 3560, we see that for... So, um, the bank manager goes through this years, year by year, and for the 2009 year, he notes that the Browers departed for the US in March, that they sold all their remaining cattle, and they were earning 211000 from adjustment and lease income. Yes. So the bank manager knew that upon their return to Australia, the Browers would need to purchase the cattle to restock Kyora and to commence stocking Jamboree. That's correct. And then for 2010, he notes that Kaiora will continue to be leased at 200000 a year and Jamboree will be adjusted back to the current owner until he sources an alternative property and can relocate livestock. Agreed rate is 175000 a year. That's correct. He also notes that the lessee of Kaiora has expressed an interest in adjusting on Jamboree if the existing owner vacates. That's correct. And he accounts for no livestock income in 2010. Yes. And then over the page 3561, he looks at 2011 and he notes that there's going to be a significant projected operating loss due to the need to spend approximately $660,000 on purchasing cattle. That's correct. Now, that makes sense when the next bullet point is read because it indicates a possible return date for the Browers of 
October uh, 2011. It should be 2011 there rather than 2010. I believe so, yeah. And the lease for Kaiora expires on the 31st of March 2011 and there's an intention that the lessee would continue to lease 50% of the property with the Browers using the other half for the cattle that they've purchased. That's correct. So the bank manager assumes that after the expiry of the lease, the lessee is going to continue to lease 50% of the property. Yes, that's my understanding. With the consequence that the lease income will continue, but it'll be reduced down to 100,000 a year. That's my understanding too, yes. And he says that the cattle are going to be purchased using farm management deposits and income from the sale of the property they're living in in the US. Yes. So it follows that if they're going to purchase $660,000 of cattle, even if they use the entirety of their farm management deposits, they were going to need a further $513,000 for that purchase. <coughs> On those calculations, yes. And there's no adjustment income from Jamboree included in the 2011 projection. No, there's not. And then for 2000. Uh, yes. Not for the entire period. I would need to check. I, I, I recall reading a cash flow whether it was included for a portion of that period. Mm -hmm. But in the credit submission, it's in not? In the credit submission, I'm sorry. No, it's not. And then for 2012, he says that the income from the lease of half of Kaiora is going to be maintained, but general expenditure is going to be 150% of the previous year. That's correct. And there's no mention of any income earned that year from adjustment on Jamboree? Not according to this. And then in 2013, he notes that uh, livestock will be at carrying capacity, being approximately 650 breeders and 1,000 feeder cattle. Yes. Purchase and sale routine in full swing with monthly turn off of trade and own bred cattle. That's correct. And then the last dot point, sufficient working capital is available. That's correct. And over the page at 3562, under the heading Security and Valuation, we see that he tells the Credit Department that security is going to be in the form of a mortgage over Kaiora and Jamboree and over a water allocation. That's correct. And over the page from that at 3563, did we see that that section concludes by the bank manager noting a group LSR is that a loan security ratio? Yes, it is. Of 43%? That's correct. Was that loan security ratio within Rabobank's guidelines? Yes, it was. What was the guideline at the time? 50%. 50%. Now, rating 12, we see at the bottom of this page, what does that mean? Um, Rabobank uses a, a risk rating model to assess the strength of the creditworthiness and strength of a file in the operational book of between R7 being the best, strongest I should say, not the best, the strongest, uh, and the rating of R15 within the productive advances of being the weakest. So it would be uh, weakest cash flow and collateral coverage, so, so what, R12. What did R12 mean then? Would, would be a, a uh, indicate a strong position. A strong position. Based on the historical results. And finally, under the general comments at 3564, the bank manager says, applicants are in a very solid financial position. Past financial results are sound, properties are well located and production is of a diverse and highly productive nature. Yes. So having been through that credit submission, is it fair to say that the bank manager thought that this was a strong proposal? The bank manager would have thought this was a strong proposal, yes. He had confidence in the ability of the Browers. Undoubted. He thought that Jamboree represented a good opportunity for expansion. Yes. He thought that the debt levels were acceptable. Yes. He thought they had the ability to service the loan. He did. And although he recognised that a significant operating loss would be incurred in 2011, he didn't think that affected the viability of the proposal. Not according to his calculations, no. And the credit submission was assessed by someone called Mark Gray within Rabobank, That's wasn't correct. it? Was That's he correct. in the credit department? Yes. And Mr Gray emailed the bank manager on the 17th of September 2009? 
Yes, indeed. We see his email at RAL 0002 0001 We see the first sentence. While on the surface the LSR is okay for this request, albeit some subjectivity re read the mining lease obviously continues on. Now, I didn't take you to that, but do you recall from the credit submission that there was reference to a mining lease on the property? Of Kiora. Oh, on Kiora, thank you. While on the surface the LSR is okay for this request, gearing is high and serviceability is very hard to get a grip on. Perhaps they are in a pretty good frame of mind in the US and maybe that frame of mind has not had them fully consider the implications two years down the track. See yes. that? Yes. Um, from now until 2012, this request does not work and most of the 2013 assessment is hypothetical. A lot can change between now and then. Yes. Mr Gray then requested information from the bank manager and asked him a large number of questions, uh, including questions about how the sale price on the American property was going to be determined. Yes. Uh, and also he wanted specific details of lease arrangements and what assumptions there are behind substitution adjustment income if the vendor, mo if the vendor moves off shortly. Yes. And he also asked for information about the investment properties owned by the Browers. Yes, he does. He queried a number of the assumptions made by the bank manager about cattle numbers and price. Yes. He queried assumptions about living expenses. Yes, he did. And you will have seen earlier that was something that Mrs Brower had reminded the bank manager not to forget in one of her earlier emails. Yes, I recall. Uh, so given that Mr Gray in the credit department says in this email that from now, late 2009 until 2012, this request does not work, would it be fair to say that there was a real risk that credit approval for the loan to the Browers to purchase Jamboree was not forthcoming at this time? On the basis it was submitted, yes. Yes. I tender that email, Commissioner. Email from Gray, 17 September 2009, RAL 0002-0013772, will be Exhibit 4.47. Now, there is a continuing email chain between Mr Gray and the Relationship Manager, the Bank Manager, uh, which I will come to next, but I see the time, Commissioner, and perhaps that is an appropriate time. Are we travelling, Ms Hall? I think if we start at 9.45 again tomorrow, that would be helpful, Commissioner. 9.45 or 9.30 was my uh, nasty thought, Ms Orr. Uh, we think 9.45 is OK. We think we're tracking fairly well, Commissioner. There's a transcript, Ms Orr. Oh. 9.45, <laughs> it oh, will dear. be. Mr James, <clears throat> uh, late yesterday I showed you an email from uh, Mark Gray within the credit department to the bank manager dated the 17th of September 2009. Yes. You recall that yes, email? Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, and having received that email from Mr Gray, the bank manager wrote to the Browers later on the same day? That's correct. Okay. And could I ask you to look at RAL 0002? Triple zero three three one nine eight. And just to remind you, the email from Mr. Gray to the bank manager was the email in which he had said that serviceability was very hard to get a grip on, and from now until 2012, the request does not work. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. Thank you. So later that day, uh, the bank manager emails uh, the Browers. And he says to them, Sydney have come back to me with a few questions, mainly to do with the rental properties and to your living expenses whilst overseas. Was that an accurate description of Mr Gray's email? Um, yes, I would say it was, yes. 
a few questions mainly to do with the rental properties and your living expenses whilst overseas? Correct. It didn't only centre on the rental properties while they were overseas. It, serviced on the, it focused on other areas. I'm sorry. Well, it focused on serviceability being hard to get a grip on and from now until 2012 the request doesn't work, didn't it? That's what he said. Yes. There's no mention of that in this email, is there? I'll put in this email. I'm sorry. No. Instead, the bank manager... Um, uh, passed on to the Browers a series of questions about their income whilst they were in the United States uh, and questions about their income and expenses for their investment properties. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Now, Mr Gray had asked the bank manager quite a large number of questions about cattle numbers, cattle price, cattle sales and turnover, as well as questions about living expenses and uh, the matters in this email, hadn't he? That's correct. Uh, and in this email, the bank manager gave the Browers no indication that the credit department within the bank had expressed doubts about the lending proposal. Not in that email. Uh, and he didn't tell the Browers that the credit department had said that the proposal wouldn't work up to 2012 and that the 2013 figures were speculative. Correct. To the contrary, we see that the bank manager closed the email by saying to the Browers, I think they just need to confirm the rental properties look after themselves and don't rely on the property for serviceability. Also try to determine the total extent of your individual liabilities. That was what the bank manager said to the Browers? That's correct. Was that an appropriate way to communicate with the Browers after the email that the bank manager had received earlier that day from the credit department? Uh, it didn't cover all aspects um, of the concerns that were raised by the approving manager. Well, it didn't cover the most significant aspects of those concerns, did it? Uh, not in that email, no. All right. Mrs Brower responded to that email, and I want to take you to that. Before doing that, I'll tender this email, Commissioner. Uh, email to Browers, 17 September 2009, RAL 0002 0003 3198, Exhibit 4.48. <coughs> now, could I take you to RAL uh, 0020033020? That's Exhibit 32 to your statement, Mr James. If it assists, I'll repeat the number, which is RAL 0002 0003 There we have it. Uh, now, <clears throat> the email's a little difficult to read because it contains Mrs Brower's responses in the body of the email. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Um, and we see that Mrs Brower answered each of the questions that the bank manager had put to her and provided him with the information that he'd sought? Yes, I can see that. And can I take you to the last bullet point, which will um, blow up in the email? In response to a question from the bank manager, which was, how easy will it be to offload the USA house given the depressed market over there and for how much? The response was, we live in a popular area. We have the last big eight acre block on the road that we live on. The land isn't used for housing here. Uh, is owned mostly by, I'm sorry, the land that isn't used for housing here is owned mostly by two long-standing entities. We have made improvements to the property and really cleaned it up since we've been here. I know that there is a lot of hype about the depressed market, uh, but it, uh, the house and land, I think that should be, if the house and land is priced right, 
we shouldn't have any trouble selling it. I know properties with older homes like ours sell quicker than the brand new ones. There certainly is more demand for the older ones as the builders don't need so much money out of them. It could take a few months to sell this property, but I'm sure that it will sell. I would assume that we could be looking at 220 to 250,000. You see that? Yes, I do. So Mrs. Brower told the bank manager that they expected to receive 220 to 250,000 for the sale of the house they had in America. Yes, I can see that. And uh, you'll recall that yesterday we spoke about the bank manager's projection in the credit submission that $660,000 would be needed for cattle purchases on the Browers' return to Australia in 2011. That's correct. And the bank manager in the credit submission uh, noted that this was going to come from farm management deposits and the sale of the property in America. Are you referring to the entire 660 coming from those sources? Yes, that was what the credit submission said, wasn't it? My understanding was that the credit submission as proposed also included $300,000 from the bank for that purpose. I see, I see. So you agreed with me yesterday that 513,000 would be needed in cleared funds after the farm management deposits were used. Do you recall that? I don't recall that figure. That's all right. Okay. Um, but if that's what it said, I, I, I understand. Yes, and it's clear from what Mrs Brower told the bank manager mm. that there was no prospect of the Browers finding anything like that from their own funds. They needed the 300,000 from the bank, didn't they? I recall seeing that. So on Mrs Brower's best estimates, the sale price before costs wouldn't even raise half the amount that they needed to stock the properties on their return. Not from that source, no. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I don't need to tender that email. You have that email in your statement. Can I take you to one that I will tender, um, which is the email from the bank manager to Mr Gray uh, three days later on the 21st of September. That's RAL 0002 0003 1490. Now in, in this email, which is the bank manager's response to the person from the credit department, that's right? Yes. Having had the exchange with Mrs Brower that we've just seen. Yes. Uh, the bank manager amended some of his initial assumptions about cattle, but he defended others. Do you agree with that? Yes, I do. So, for example, um, in the last dot point on this page, if we could have the subsequent page brought up on the other side, that would assist. He recognised that he'd underestimated the number of bulls required, and he agreed that another 10 to 15 bulls would be required and he estimated a cost of 2,500 per bull. That's correct. And in the second last dot point on the first page, he copied the information provided by Mrs Brower about the likely sale price of the home in the United States. That's correct. Uh, and on the second page, we see that in the uh, fifth last bullet point, so if we go to uh, one, two, three, four, five up from the bottom. What are the specific details? If we could have this blown up, it would be useful. What are the specific details of lease arrangements? And what assumptions are there behind substituting adjustment income if the vendor moves off shortly? Yes. And the answer that uh, the bank manager gave the credit department to that question was that the Kyora lease expires on the 31st of March 2011 with a two-year option from that date, annual amount of 200000 paid quarterly in advance. The lease has been perused by legal. Parties have agreed upon a one plus one year lease for Jamboree at 175000 as part of the purchase agreement. Uh, this is still to be finalised as with all other property title and survey details. So this was the bank manager's response to the matters raised by the credit department. Correct. Thank you. I tender that document. Email to Gray, 21 September 2009, RAL 0002 0003 exhibit 4.49. And the following day, uh, the bank manager wrote back to the Browers. Uh, if I could take you to RAL 0002 
Now, at this point, on the 22nd of September, the bank manager says to the Browers in the first paragraph, there's been a bit of back and forth discussion with Sydney, but it would appear that we'll get an approval for the property purchase, although not officially approved as yet. And in the second paragraph, Sydney are of the opinion that we should reassess the initial limit of the loan and look to utilise some of the available funds now rather than retain them for livestock purchases when you are looking to return to full control of Kaiora. So on that basis, they would provide a facility of 3.7 million, refinance the main loan, which was the million dollar loan, at approximately 800,000 balance, with an additional 2.9 million for the property purchase at this stage. The 200,000 facility remains in place, making 3.7 plus 200, total facilities of 3.9. <coughs> Then in March 2011, when the lease expires, provide an increase for livestock purchases based on your plans and the cattle market at that time. Yes. And until this point, the proposal had always been for facility limits of 4.2 million. Correct. But now the total facility limit of 3.9 million is proposed. And the situation was that the existing $200,000 facility was to remain in place. In the personal names, correct? Yes. And the undrawn portion of the existing $1 million facility was to be cancelled, with that becoming an $800,000 facility? Uh, no, with that becoming a $200,000 facility, I understand. And then the balance being transferred across to the loan in the company name. To so make a total, I'm sorry. Yes, you can carry on, Mr. James. Excuse me. So my understanding is is that the residual from the joint borrowings, the eight hundred thousand dollars, was to transfer into uh, the company. Yes. Uh, to be added to the acquisition of Jamboree. Yes. Sorry, is that what you're saying? Yes, it I'm was. Sorry. Yes. Apologies. So it became an eight hundred thousand dollar facility, uh, and the two hundred thousand was still in place in the personal names. Uh, and so rather than $3 million for the purchase of the property, only 2.9 was to be extended. Is that right? No, it's not as I understand it, I'm sorry. Right. So could you explain what this sentence means about on that basis they would provide a facility of 3.7, refinance the main loan at 800 balance with an additional 2.9 for the property purchase? Yeah, my understanding is, is that the $3.7 million limit that was to be created for the company uh, incorporated the $2.9 million increase to acquire Jamboree. Yes. The $800,000 you are referring to was to be added to that figure and become one loan for $3.7 million. Yes. The residual debt was to remain in joint names of $200,000. When you say the residual debt, are you oh, referring to the existing $200,000 facility, the separate $200,000 facility? Correct. So that's, that's what I'm trying to understand. They had a $200,000 facility and they had a $1 million yes. facility. And in this um, new loan, that $1 million was only going to be $800,000. And then there was going to be 2.9 added to it. So 2.9 plus 800 gives us the 3.7. And they kept their $200,000 facility. That's correct. Yes, good. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, I read to you before the sentence which was in March 2011, when the lease expires, uh, the bank will provide an increase for livestock purchases based on your plans and the cattle market at that time. Mm. Now, yes. you, you accept that this email was read by the Browers as an assurance from the bank that further funds would be provided by the bank in March 2011 for livestock purchases? I understand that it would have been interpreted that way, yes. You understand it would have been interpreted that way? I can't be certain because I wasn't interpreting it myself, but I think it would be reasonable to think that Mr and Mrs Brower would have interpreted it that way. Is there any other interpretation of it, Mr James? In March 2011, when the lease expires, provide an increase for livestock purchases based on your plans and the cattle market at the time. Yeah. My only, my only thoughts on that when I read that, um, whilst respecting the position that Mr and Mrs Brower would have taken in reading it, was that there was earlier reference to them being able to potentially stock the properties from their own reserves. But it was clear by this point that they couldn't stock the properties from their own reserves. I hadn't done the calculations between when that assumption was made and this. 
Well, was, from all of the documents we've gone to, it's patently clear, isn't it, that they didn't have the money to stock the properties upon their return to Australia without the further money from the bank? The earlier representation indicated that, that that was possible. Uh, and, the, and the sources that that was to come from were from the sale of the US property. Yes, which was, we've seen, 220 to 250,000. That's right. And they had 147,000 in um, farm management deposits. That's correct. So they didn't have enough money to stock the properties on their return without funding from the bank, did they? I, I can't confirm that, I'm sorry, because also in that, in that comment from Mr and Mrs Brow, or from Mrs Brow, was that we could also source funds from other sources. And I wasn't certain in reading that whether it was equity from the sale of some of the several investment properties they owned or not. I'm not, I'm not certain. Mm -hmm. That was referenced in that uh, prior communication. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I do acknowledge that that is a reasonable representation that we would assist them in the future. A, a reasonable I think interpretation? So. I think is so. that what you interpretation. mean? Interpretation. Yes, Yes, I agree you. with that. OK. You agree with that now, but you didn't originally agree with that in your statement to the Commission, did you, Mr James? No, I didn't, no. No. In the first version of your statement that you provided to the Commission, you disputed Mrs Brower's assertion that further funds had been anticipated by the Browers at the time that the purchase of Jamboree was being considered? I did, yeah. So what's made you change your mind, Mr James? Well, after my first statement, I continued to reflect and continued to consult uh, I spoke to the uh, approving manager. Um, I spoke to the, the subsequent manager who, who was looking after the file. Uh, and my understanding uh, grew as I went, and, and that was the conclusion I came to. I didn't stop reviewing the file after I'd signed my statement. Thank you, Mr James. I tender that document, Commissioner. Email to Browse 22 September 2009, RAL 002 003 1645, Exhibit 4.50. Now, you, you said in answer to one of my questions earlier, uh, perhaps twice you said this, Mr James, when I asked you if um, an earlier email drew the Brower's attention to the Credit Department's view that uh, uh, that I want to make sure I put this correctly, that serviceability was hard to, very hard to get a grip on and from now until 2012 the request doesn't work and most of the 2013 assessment is hypothetical. Mm. I asked you about that and I think twice you said not in this email. Is there any email in which those matters were brought to the attention of the Browers? Could you repeat that? I'm sorry. Yes. So the... I, I put to you earlier that one of the fundamental concerns expressed by the credit department in the email with the bank manager uh, was that serviceability didn't work under this proposal. Yes. Now, um, I asked you if in the earlier emails that was drawn to the attention of the Browers and you said it wasn't, not in those emails. I just want to give you an opportunity to identify if there is any other email where you say that was drawn to the attention of the Browers. Yes. No, it wasn't drawn to the attention of the Browse from what Thank I could you. see. There was context you. with my comment, but it wasn't brought to the attention of the They Browse. were never told that, were they? No, they weren't. Thank you. And should they have been told that, Mr James? I believe so. Yes. Now, um, having received this email on the 22nd of September telling them that approval's coming, even though it hasn't officially been approved, uh, the following day, we know from Exhibit 37 to your statement that the bank manager told the Browers that the limit of $3.7 had been approved. Is that right? Um, now, you tell us in the second statement uh, that you gave the Commission that you re you've now reviewed all of the documents relating to the credit assessment and approval of the facility for Jamboree. Yes. And in that second statement that you gave to the Commission on Friday last week, you said that you had now formed the view that the proposal for the acquisition of Jamboree, which involved the leasing of both properties, Kaiora and Jamboree, until the Browers returned from America and commenced their livestock purchases in March 2011, was not one which would enable them to service interest on the proposed facility. That's correct. You now accept that? I do accept that. And you accept that the Browers made clear that they 
did not propose to lease the properties for the foreseeable future. They only proposed to lease them until they returned home and started building cattle numbers to the full running capacity of the properties. Yes, but I, I do need to explain my thinking process on that, if you don't mind. Yes, please. So my, my original thoughts on that centred on, again, the communication um, between Mrs Brower and, um, and the account manager uh, at the time, and it did reference uh, in one of those emails uh, that the properties could be um, leased uh, upon their return. Uh, I believe that the context of that was not to be leased indefinitely. No, it wasn't, was it? I understand that. It was always clear that they were leasing until they could um, uh, stock the properties until their, to their full capacity. That's correct. Yes. Uh, and my original uh, assessment of that, and um, I'm was that? Yes. Was not that, I should say, was that, that, was that there was potential for Mr and Mrs Brower to return and continue to lease the properties until they could stock them. But as I reviewed this, and, and as I studied the correspondence, mm. and as I spoke to the approving manager, and as I spoke to the subsequent manager, uh, account manager, um, my view altered. Mm. Uh, and, and I came to understand the expectations uh, of Mr and Mrs Brower. Well, you came to understand that this was never a serviceable loan, didn't you? In the context it was submitted, no. Yes. You, it was never a serviceable loan? Is that the answer? I just want to understand what your no yeah. to that question okay. meant, I'm Mr not, James. I'm sorry, I'm not Do trying you... to be evasive. No, no, no. I, it's important I'm not that suggesting I that. that. Um, there were two components of serviceability with the loan. Mm -hmm. and, and the component of serviceability that, that, that was centred on running the operation as a cattle operation with Mr and Mrs Brow's own cattle it was very difficult to establish serviceability on that basis. Mm. That was the basis with which it was proposed. And, and I understand and respect the fact that that was the basis on which Mr and Mrs Brower expected they had an approval. There was a second assessment within the component of that submission that the credit manager undertook prudently uh, to say that the business could service the, ex the exposure on a lease arrangement. Yes. But the expectation of the Browers was not to continue to lease it. And that is where my, my view has changed on this as I've reviewed the file. Yes. Um, so it was clear to everyone at the time that they didn't intend to lease for the foreseeable future. Therefore, that second basis of serviceability wasn't available, was it? No, it wasn't. Thank Certainly you. not without communication with Mr and Mrs Brower. Well, not, not without them changing their plans. I understand. Yes. Now, you also say in your statement that even if the Browers were able to build cattle numbers to the full running capacity of the properties from their own financial resources, the proposed facility still couldn't have been serviced. On the calculations I did, no. Yep. And in those circumstances, the conduct of the bank in approving the facility without telling the Browers that it could not be serviced if they ran both properties um, fell below community standards and expectations. You concede that. I do, on, on the basis of fairness. Yes, you say in your statement that it was in accordance with the expectations the Brower had for servicing the proposed facility by leasing the properties for a short period only, and in that sense it was, you say, unfair to them. I believe so. Yes. Uh, and you also say in your statement that therefore it may also have been in breach of the code of banking practice and therefore be characterised as misconduct. It may be. Uh, is it? Well, if I read it uh, uh, to the letter, I believe it is. If you read what to the letter, Mr James? Code. Yes. And at that time, uh, Clause 2.2 .2 of the Code obliged Rabobank to act fairly and reasonably. Uh, you may have heard me read this clause a number of times over the last few days. Uh, act fairly and reasonably towards the Browers in a consistent and ethical manner. Yes. You accept that Rabobank breached that obligation? Uh, in the context of the fairness aspect of it, yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, now, can I ask you to consider another clause of the Banking Code of Practice? Uh, if we could have this brought up on the screen, RCD I would ask you to consider clause 25.1. Before we offer or give you a credit facility, 
or increase an existing credit facility, we will exercise the care and skill of a diligent and prudent banker in selecting and applying our credit assessment methods and in forming our opinion about your ability to repay it. Yes. Rabobank also breached this provision of the Code of Banking Practice, didn't they, I Mr believe James? So. I believe so. You accept that? Now, at the point the offer of the facilities was made, it was reasonable for the Browers to believe that they had the trust and support of their bank manager and therefore of the bank, wasn't it? I believe so. Uh, and you've accepted that it was the bank manager who first told the Browers that Jamboree was for sale? That's correct. Uh, and in the very first email communication he had with them about Jamboree, he estimated a price for the block, the entire block, of $4 million. He had mentioned that price, yes. And he then valued the block at $4 million. Uh, which re reflected the contract price, correct? Yes. And at the time of that first communication with the Browers, uh, they were already clients of Rabobank, and Rabobank um, was well aware of their financial position. That's correct. There could never have been any doubt that the expansion of their operations was a long-term proposition, could there? On the basis submitted, no. And that cash flow would be very difficult in the early phase. Correct. Uh, and the Browers were entitled to think that Rabobank was supporting them in their expansion of their operations. That's correct. Okay. Now, the ultimate purchase price <coughs> that was agreed for the Browers portion of Jamboree um, was roughly $2.84 million. Correct. And the Browers entered into a contract of sale in July 2009. That's correct. And in January 2010, the bank sent them a letter of offer for a new all-in-one account with a loan limit of $3.7 million. Correct. And that represented the $2.9 million for the purchase and the $800,000 as a refinance of the existing $1 million facility. That's correct. Okay. And that facility, the new uh, all-in-one account, was to expire on the 30th of June 2024. Um, I don't recall their expiry date, but if that is in the document, yes. 15-year term was standard, was it? Uh, that's correct. Would you like me just to show you that document, or are you happy to accept happy that to that accept was the that. term? Thank you. Uh, and then, due to delays in the subdivision of the block, which you heard Mrs Brower give evidence about, the sale didn't complete until August 2010. That's correct. Uh, and given that settlement took more than 12 months, was a revised credit submission done prior to settlement? I know it wasn't. Uh, was the previous credit submission reviewed by the credit department again? The credit department reviewed the decision in the subsequent uh, approval when the $3.7 million, when, when the letter of offer issued, it had been reviewed, but after that letter of offer had issued, no, it hadn't, no. So I'm sorry, not between the time when that letter of offer issued and then. Yes, over that ex no. extended period, the, the 12 months prior to settlement, there was no fresh credit submission nor any review of the existing credit submission. Not that I'm aware of. And should there have been? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Right, so why didn't that happen? I can't answer that, I'm sorry. Okay. And during that period, there were further discussions between the bank manager and Mrs Brower? Oh, there would have been, yes. Yes, and I want to show you an email, which is an email from Mrs Brower to the bank manager on the 3rd of June 2010. So this is about seven months after the loan has been approved. Yes. Uh, RAL 0002003 Now, sorry, I'll just wait for that to come up. Now, if we could turn to the subsequent page, 1550, this is an email chain. And you'll see an email from uh, the Browers on the 3rd of June 2010 to the bank manager. Hi, how's things? Just checking that everything is getting done for the settlement on Jamboree. I am needing a little refreshment on the 3.7 million that is unfunded. 
is this the amount of the total loan or will that be amount be enough to cover all the stamp duty, legals, etc., for this purchase? You see that? Yes, I do. And in response, uh, at 1549, uh, the bank manager tells the Browers in the first line there, I'm pretty sure that the original intent was for us to fund the property purchase and you would pay the stamp duty and legals from available funds, being FMDs and investments. You see that? Yes, that's in accordance with an earlier email between the two parties before settlement. Well, before uh, the approval. it wasn't the original intent, was it? Uh, during, in correspondence from my recollection between Mrs Brower and the account manager, uh, there was reference made to stamp duty and the account manager believed that that was going to be paid for well, we saw out of reserves. We saw the reference to stamp duty in an earlier email I took you to where there's an analysis of income expenses and available funds and then a reference to about $120,000 of stamp duty. Is that the email you were referring to? Yes. Yes. So there's certainly a reference to stamp duty in there, but there was no reference to that being paid out of the Brower's existing funds, was there? No, it wasn't, nor was there reference to that being paid uh, in the approval letter. Well, in the credit submission that I took to you earlier, took you to earlier, the bank manager had identified the farm management deposits as one of the two sources of funding for the cattle purchases when the Browers came back. Um, as well as the equity from the sale of a property, yes, correct. So he can't have also been thinking that they were going to be used to pay the stamp duty and the legals. I'm sorry, I can't assume what he was thinking, but the credit approval did not include Yep. Um, coverage for the payment of stamp duty for $120,000. It's right, clearly well, not stated in there. And I, I'm just querying this statement about the original intent that I've taken you to uh, in this sentence. Um, we see that the bank manager says in this email that at the time of the original submission, there was well over $200,000 available in the main loan. But because this has taken much longer than anticipated, the balance has come back a bit. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Uh, and now an extra $40,000 is required to go towards the purchase price. Yes, I see that. Uh, and the bank manager set out his understanding of the funds available to the Browers. You currently have the following funds available. In the million dollar figure facility, 103000 in the $200,000 facility, 67000 and a credit-only account of 31000 So that's a total of $202,146. Yes. But there wasn't 103000 available in the million-dollar facility, was there? No, there wasn't. Um, because the total borrowing that had been offered and accepted <coughs> was the 3.9, which comprised the 200 and the 800 that was the refinancing of the million dollar facility. That's correct. Uh, plus the 2.9 to buy Jamboree. That's correct. So there was no amount available for drawdown on the million dollar, the old million dollar facility, was there? There would have been the difference between, uh, no, there, there wouldn't have, because the limit was to have been readjusted it was gone. to 800,000. It had become an $800,000 facility subsumed in the new uh, $3.7 million facility. Drawn to nearly 900,000. Yes. That's correct. Well, Over that 12 month period. Yes. So, um, is it the case that what happened was the million dollar facility wasn't paid out at the time the loan was accepted, but continued to be available to the Browers for their use and to continue to accrue interest? Absolutely. And that would have been the intention. Well, as a consequence of that, instead of requiring 800,000 to repay the facility, mm. more would be required. Because of the utilisation of those funds for the business during that period. That's right. And so could I point out that yes. even had the circumstance come about that you suggest, those funds still would have been utilised even if they were in the main loan. But the main loan couldn't be established at that time because the additional collateral wasn't available th through Jamboree because the property hadn't settled at so that period. So it would always be the case that the settlement would happen when the property transfer was effected. Uh, so is that why Rabobank didn't pay out the million dollar loan immediately after it was refinanced down to $800,000? That's correct. Okay. And the utilisation of those funds, from what I can see reviewing cash flows, 
would have been utilised had those funds been in the main loan mm -hmm. or had they been in the uh, new entity. So given that there was considerable delay in the settlement, uh, it was reasonable for the Browers to continue to use the million dollar facility? Of course, mm -hmm. yes. And was it reasonable for them to assume that the facility would be paid out by the new loan? Providing there are available funds there well, after, that, after trading, yes. That's what they'd intended from the outset, wasn't it? That's correct. And they'd applied to draw that facility to its limit, you'll recall that, but Rabobank had decided to limit the facility uh, to its balance at the time of the credit application. That's the 800000 that's right. Well, 896,000 ultimately, yes. Well, it's a difference. It becomes 896,000 because of the passage of time, doesn't it? Exactly. Well, do you think this might have been quite confusing for the Browers, uh, Mr. James? You've refinanced the million dollar facility down to an $800,000 facility, but you've continued to allow them to use it as if it's a million dollar facility. I'm not at odds with that process. No, but what I want to put to you that is that that must have been very confusing for the Browers, and it was clearly confusing to your bank manager. I, I'm sorry, I can't speak for the Browers. I can't understand. I can't uh, speak to what level of confusion or understanding they would have had with that. However, I will. I will volunteer that this is why we should have done a review of the exactly. facility. I understand exactly. that. Uh, now. At the time the bank manager sent this email in June 2010, he assumed that the Browers still had the right to use the funds that weren't drawn down on the million dollar facility at the time it was refinanced to an $800,000 facility. That's correct. Okay. Um, and he told the Browers um, incorrectly that they had $103,000 available to them from that million dollar facility. He'd done the calculation between the original limit of a million yes. and the subsequent limit of 800, I would yes. suggest. All right. I tender that email, Commissioner. Email from Browers to Rabobank, 3 June 2010, RAL 002-003-1549, Exhibit 4.51. And then in August 2010, can I take you to an email sent by another Rabobank employee um, to the bank manager? who on forwarded it to the Browers, that's RAL 0002 And can I ask you to turn to the email in the chain on 3470, where we see an email from um, Tiffany Jorgensen uh, to the bank manager on the 19th of August 2010? Yes. And we see there that Ms Jorgensen set out the funds required to fund the property settlement. So this is right before the settlement's due to take place. Yes. And they don't appear to include stamp duty there. No, they don't. Uh, so she sets out the funds that are needed as being 2.79 million. You see that? Yes, I do. And she then noted, notes that the refinance of the $1 million facility is to take place, and she sets out the balance of that facility, which is 974387 plus interest, which took the total amount owing on that facility to 983. Yes. Uh, so it followed that $3.77 million was required for the settlement of Jamboree. That's correct. And she set out the funds that were available for settlement, and that was the new 3.7 facility, about $6,000 that was undrawn on the 200,000 um, personal names facility, and another $4,000 from another account. That's correct. So that meant that even fully drawing on the new facility, the Browers had to find another $62,651 to complete the purchase. That's correct. And then at 3470, having had that email forwarded on to her, um, Mrs Brower responds at the top of the page, um, uh, I transferred 50000 from my farm management deposit to the Shea Tim account. Will this be enough money to cover everything? I thought we were only coming up 26000 short. Am I confused? Yes, I see that. Okay, so you can see from that that Mrs Brower 
um, was a little confused by all of this. Uh, and if we move to 3469, we see that Mrs Brower speaks of having the undrawn balance of the $1 million facility available as a backup. Do you see that? Trying to get the thread and I write on. In the middle of the page. Um, I see. But that facility was going to be closed. Yes. So it seems that Mrs. Brower was labouring under the misconception that the original proposal, which included fully financing, fully drawing the $1 million facility before it was refinanced, was in fact what had been agreed to. I can see that, yes. Which would explain their the Browers' continued use of that facility in the period between uh, agreeing to the letters of offer and the much later settlement of the property. That's correct. And can you see then the, relation, the bank manager's um, response uh, at the top of the page? Sorry, probably didn't explain that well enough. The refinance amount of the $1 million facility was at 975000 round figure. If we'd drawn on the 25000 available to help with the property purchase, then the refinance amount would have been $1 million. So either way, it works out the same. We did a calculation on the basis that those funds were available when really they weren't. Yes. It became very confusing over that 12-month period, it appears. Well, why was he doing calculations on the basis of funds that were available that were not available to the Browers? Are you talking about from the outset when the assessment was done? I'm talking about, well, there's multiple periods at which we could ask that question, isn't there, Mr James? Well, again, I, uh, yes, there are. I, I come back to, to the, the point that when the original assessment was done, it was 12 months before the settlement, lots had um, transpired between that period, but we ought to have done a review. Mm. And communicated consistently with the Browers about what funds were and were not available to them. Central to the entire issue. And you did not do that? I don't believe we did that adequately in this case, no. So at the very minimum, the bank manager communicated inconsistently with the Browers about their ability to use the undrawn portion of the million dollar original facility. I believe there was confusion with that and, and, and poor communication, yes. Poor communication. And we see in this email that the bank manager says, after saying that we did a calculation on the basis that those funds were available when they really, really they weren't, hope that's a bit clearer. You definitely didn't. You definitely don't lose the twenty-five thousand. You see that? Yes, I do. But they definitely did lose the use of the twenty-five thousand, didn't they? They did after settlement. Yes. Yes, it was Before gone. settlement, they hadn't, but they did after settlement. Yes. yes, but that part, that undrawn part of the million-dollar facility after settlement, was lost, wasn't it? Because the fresh limit was eight hundred thousand. That's right. Contrary to what the bank manager told them. Yes. And the only way the Jamboree purchase could settle was if the Browers paid for stamp duty and legal fees from other funds and used part of the $2.9 million that had been set aside for the purchase of Jamboree uh, to repay the $1 million facility. That was the outcome. Mm. Was that an acceptable outcome, Mr James? Uh, well, in the scheme of the, uh, the settlement and, and the shortfall, no. And it necessarily meant that the $3.7 million facility was fully drawn from the moment it was put in place and there were no funds available uh, to meet expenses associated with either the purchase or the stocking of the property when the Browers returned. Not from leveraged capital, no. And it meant that the, fa the Browers farm management deposit account was reduced to affect the settlement. That's correct. That being one of the two sources of funding that had been identified for the restocking um, from the Browers' own funds when they returned to Australia. That was one of the sources that had been identified, correct? Mm. Wasn't the reality that from the time the property settled, even if things had travelled entirely in accordance with the plan, in that the American house had sold for the value that Mrs Brower had ascribed to it, and the rental payments on Kyora and Jamboree came in as expected, the prospect of the Browers servicing the new facility and meeting the expenditure that would be required to get the properties working uh, was virtually nil. 
I think the original assessment uh, on that scenario with the property stock, as I'd said earlier, uh, was for mine uh, not going to be sustainable. Um, and I need to, I'm sorry, I need to break it, uh, to give uh, a full understanding and for completeness to break it into, into two. But I must also respect that Mr and Mrs Brower's understanding was different. But the thinking behind it was purely to fund the acquisition of the properties to lease until such time as they returned, then make a reassessment. The email was sent, was sent without the authority of the approving person uh, in, in terms of stocking the property into the future. Uh, so to answer your question, no, uh, it would not have um, stood uh, as an economic proposition mm. stocked uh, as a lease position for an interim period to enable Mr and Mrs Brow to acquire Jamboree, yes, as a hold position, I believe it would have. But that was not the intention, I understand. It was entirely predictable that the Browse would have cash flow difficulties, wasn't it? Well, it became that way. Yeah, but it it became... was... I want to come to that, but Sorry. first I'd yeah. just like you to um, consider whether it was predictable that that was what was going to happen. Well, that's a good question and one that I'm going to find difficult to answer because I couldn't predict it at that time and it then goes to the whole hindsight scenario that I've struggled with. Why couldn't you predict it at that time, based on all that we've seen, Mr James? Oh, well, I'm talking about the scenario of being able to acquire the properties and lease them. That was predictable, yes. But, but wasn't it obvious, having fully drawn down uh, the uh, new facility uh, and already having dipped into the farm management deposits to pay uh, uh, stamp duty and legals, that there were immediately going to be cash flow difficulties? That became evident, yes. I'm uh, sorry, I thought your question was at the approval. I, I just want to be very clear about this. It was evident right from the time of the first credit memorandum. On that scenario, yes. yes. On which scenario? On, on, on the, the real, scenario that was before the bank. On the yes. real scenario, yes. on what was going yes. to happen. Yes. Yes, yes. thank you. Uh, I attended this email chain, Commissioner. Uh, emails to Browse, uh, <coughs> August 2010. Uh, RAL 0002, 0003, 3469, Exhibit 4.52. The cash flow difficulties became apparent very quickly, didn't they, Mr James? They did. Mm. And in September 2010, we see an email from Mrs Brower to the bank manager, which is RAL 0002, 0003, 3106. And if I could ask you to look at the email towards the bottom of the page, and if we could blow that up, you'll see that it's an email from the Browers to the bank manager on the 17th of September. Uh, Mrs Brower says, it's come to my attention that the interest for the July-September quarter may be coming out of our account in a few weeks. There won't be enough to cover it unless I transfer more money out of our farm management deposits. I had hoped to avoid that scenario. Was it the bank's intention that Adrian and I drain our farm management deposits? Anyway, is there something that you can do to put the payment back until mid-September when the lease payment money has come in? Thanks, Wendy. You see that? Yes, I do. And in response, we see the bank manager propose two options uh, that would avoid the need to further draw down from the farm management deposits. Yes. And this, the discussion of this issue continued for a number of weeks. Have you seen that in the documents? Yes, I have. I attended this email chain, Commissioner. Uh, email from Browse, 17 September 2010, RAL 0002 0003 Exhibit 4.53. And if we turn to RAL 0002 0003 3094, And we look at the first email in that chain at 3095. This is the 25th of September. And if we could blow up that red text, Mrs Brower says to the bank manager, I'm not sure what to do about rearranging the timing of this payment of interest. We don't really want a six month situation and would prefer quarterly, but with the way the cash is flowing, we need the payment to be the, at the end of the month, first month of quarter, for the cash to be in the account. Can we do something like that? I know that means that the quarters are going to be off for a little while, 
but we have to build up some reserves as well as pay the bills for a little while. What do you think? You see that? Yes, I do. And then if we turn to 3094, we see that there's a discussion about how the Browers can judge things to make the interest payment of 24500 that's going to fall due at the end of the month. Yes, I do. So it's clear in September 2010 that there are real cash flow issues already for the Browers. Yes, I can. And this is only one month after the new facilities been put in place in August 2010. That's correct. And by the end of that year, the Browers were having real difficulties servicing the loan, weren't they? Yes, they were. They were entirely dependent on lease payments to service the loan. And without the loan interest payments being coordinated with the timing of the receipt of those lease payments, they couldn't service it, could they? But not without additional cash injections. Mm -hmm. And uh, would Rabobank expect uh, their bank manager to take any particular steps in those circumstances where they're experiencing these difficulties? I, I, would, I would hope that there was some, uh, some investigation done at the time on the catalyst for the circumstances so early in, and I can't speculate as to why not, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, you said you would hope that there was? I would hope that there was some investigation done into the catalyst for that occurrence. Yes. And I can't comment as to whether or not there was. You've seen nothing to suggest that there was any investigation done at that time? That's correct. I, I see. I tender this email, Commissioner. Emails of 25 September 2010 from the Browse, RAL 0002 0003 3094, Exhibit 4.54. And then by January the following year, in 2011, um, there'd been uh, very severe floods in the region where the properties were located. Yes, they have. And did you hear me read out the email that Mrs Brower sent to the bank manager uh, after becoming aware that the lessee of Kaiora was going to terminate the lease as a result of those floods? Yes, I did. Uh, and did you, do you agree that the Browers did the right thing by contacting their bank manager immediately and notifying him of the difficulties that they now faced? Yes, I did. And Rubberbank was always aware that the primary source of income for the Browers while they were in the United States, and even in the initial um, year of their return, was the income from the leases. That's a reasonable assumption, yes. Yes. Uh, and it appears from the email that Mrs Brower sent that uh, the difficulties they experienced at that time were caused to some degree, uh, perhaps primarily, by a natural disaster. That's correct. Uh, and did Rabobank support the Browers to deal with the consequences of this natural disaster? There was an email from the account manager in response to Mrs Brower that did point out some assistance available through government funding. Yes, yes, there is. And can I show you another email uh, as well, uh, which is uh, RAL 0002 0003 2646. Um, now, this email contains the, at the bottom of the page, the email that I read out from Mrs Brower yesterday, and we see the bank manager's response to that email at the top of the page. Yes, I've read that response. And you can see that he says in the second last paragraph, I'm sorry to hear about the lease, particularly when there was no notice. I'm just wondering if Neil might still be an interested party, as I think he still wants to get his breeder numbers up. You might have already approached him. Uh, and then he goes on at the bottom of that email to say, stay in touch and we'll work out some sort of strategy. The bank is taking some pretty relaxed attitudes towards increases required directly as a result of the floods. That's correct. I tender that email, Commissioner. Emails 14 January 2011 between Browse and Rabo Bank RAL. 0002-0003-2646, Exhibit 4.55. And to assist you, uh, Mr James, can I also take you to RAL 0002-0003-3492. I think that may be the email you were referring to where information was provided um, by the bank manager about forms of government assistance yes, that's for the correct. disaster. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. I'll tender that email too. 
But going back... Uh, Just a moment. Email from Rabobank, 14 January uh, 11, concerning uh, flood assistance. Going back to the... Just a moment. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, RAL 0002, 0003, 3492, four point, uh, Exhibit 4.56. I'm sorry, Commissioner. Uh, I... <laughs> As you can tell, I'm not, I'm, even, I'm not even <laughs> saying get on with it, Ms. <laughs> <laughs> I've got my time limit I have to stick to, having announced it yesterday, Commissioner. Um, I, I wanted to take you back to the first of those two emails. They're both on the same day, the 14th of January. And just to that final part, I'll read it to you again. Um, the bank is taking some pretty relaxed attitudes towards increases required directly as a result of the floods. Now, what I want to put to you is that, as it turned out, the bank didn't take a relaxed attitude towards uh, the increase to the facility that the Browers required upon their return to Australia. Um, I'm sorry, you'll have to explain what you mean by take a relaxed attitude. Well, they didn't, they didn't give it to them. We did. did we provided oh. the $300,000. Provided the 300000 on condition that within two years the Browers make a repayment of $3 million. That's correct. Right. Uh, that's not taking a relaxed attitude uh, towards the request for the $300,000, is it? Uh, I, I don't have an opinion on whether that's relaxed or not. I'm sorry. I, I just see. don't. I see. If I so, did, I'd give it, but I'm sorry I don't. I understand. Um, at this time, when the Browers come back to Australia, they've been clients of Rabobank since 2005. That's correct. They have never defaulted. No. And only months prior, Rabobank's financed their acquisition of Jamboree. That's correct. And Rabobank, at the time of acquisition, knew that lease income was critical to the proposal working. That's correct. And now Rabobank's been told that the lease has been terminated as a result of a natural disaster. That's correct. So shouldn't Rabobank have at least considered whether the terms of the facility should be altered uh, in a way that at least gave interim relief to the Browers until they were um, back on their feet and getting the properties operational? The position certainly should have been reviewed. And was it? I could see no evidence of it. All right. So the Browers returned to Australia in... Um, it should have been reviewed at what level in the bank? I believe it should have been put back before the credit department of the bank for consideration. Yes. And was it to yield this notion of you're going to have 300 if you pay us back 3 million in two years? That position was, Commissioner. The, so the ultimate approval that came was through the credit department on that review. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm just not then, I think, I'm not understanding uh, what you're telling me. Uh, what should have been considered by the bank? The position that, I'm sorry, I may have been a step behind this all. Um, my, my comment to there was no review done was when the disaster struck. At that point, I think it would have been prudent for a review to have been done on the file and the impact. The review that was ultimately done was upon the request from, from Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Brower to fund the $300,000 for the cattle. That position was reviewed and formally put before the bank. So it's March 2011 when the Browers come back to Australia. Is that right? That's correct. And upon their return, they seek assistance from the bank uh, very quickly. They did. Uh, and not long after they returned, the bank manager, of whom we've been speaking, ceased to be their bank manager? That's correct. And why was that? He was transferred to another branch. I see. And did he subsequently leave the bank? He did. When did that happen? I believe it was 2014, but I would need to check. I'm sorry. And why did he leave the bank? Uh, he resigned from the bank. What were the circumstances of his resignation? Uh, I'm not sure of his decision to resign uh, from the bank and what that was based on. You don't know what it was based on? I don't know what his final decision was to resign from the bank. And what about the bank's position towards him at the time of his resignation? He was being counselled. What was he being counselled for? Uh, general application of his duties. 
Could you elaborate on that, Mr James? In terms of the uh, key performance indicators uh, that we looked at yesterday, uh, the, his account manager or his, his reporting manager uh, reviewed his performance against those key performance indicators and uh, had come to the conclusion that he was not performing uh, in terms of the requirements for the key performance ind indicators and then uh, counselling ensued. He wasn't meeting his lending target KPIs, was he? Among others, yes. Yes. Uh, and concerns were also raised about valuations that he'd conducted where he'd adopted past assessments of properties without considering shifts in the market? Uh, there was one instance that we'd identified, yes. Mm -hmm. So in uh, 2013, he went on a performance improvement plan, didn't he? He did. And uh, could I uh, show you that? It's RAL 0004 0001 0001. I saw there may be an error with this document. If you could point it. that out yeah. to me as we go through yeah. it, that would be helpful. Thank you, Mr James. Now, um, uh, what page is the error on? Could we deal with that first? Uh, it may be the entire document, but I won't know until we go to the next page. Uh, in, in what sense might it be the entire document? I don't believe it's his performance improvement plan. Ah, I see. So this is a performance improvement plan that was provided to the Commission under a notice to produce that related to the particular bank manager. Are you saying that Rabobank has provided someone else's instead? I will know that when we turn the page. All right, we can do that. We'll turn to 0002. That's the incorrect document. All right, so you've given the Commission the wrong performance improvement plan, have you? Yes, I have an explanation for that if you want to hear it. Uh, sure. Uh, it was titled, uh, The Manager, in question. Uh, but it appears that the manager that uh, was undertaking the performance improvement plan had used a template uh, that was provided to him from a previous employment, uh, performance improvement plan from our human resource department and didn't delete out the items that referred to the other manager. That's so, as best I can understand it, Ms. All. So although it bears the name of the bank manager we've been discussing, it does not in fact relate to him? That document does not relate to him. All right. I um, believe that... I'm sorry. No, no, carry I'm on. Sorry, I, I believe that he has simply used that as a template and yes. then has not cut out uh, the reference to the other manager from a completely different branch. So do we have the performance improvement plan for the bank manager we've been speaking of? There is a performance improvement plan, but it's not complete. Has that been provided to the Commission? I believe it has. Perhaps if your council could be good enough to identify which document that is because we've been labouring under the misapprehension that the one with the bank manager's name on it was his performance improvement plan. I apologise, I identified that only two days ago. All right, well perhaps if that document could be identified we can uh, see what that document says about this bank manager but you have already accepted to me uh, that uh, the bank manager was on a performance improvement plan and that he wasn't meeting his KPIs, including his lending target KPIs. That's correct. And in late 2013, it appeared to us from the documents, he left the bank. You think it may have been 2014? Um, if, if you have 2013 written there, that would likely be the correct date. Hmm. All right. It was on or about, I'm sorry. We, we saw, I, I won't tend to this document. Strange. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we saw yesterday that uh, the bank manager's KPIs included um, lending targets for rural loans of $15 million. You recall that? That's correct. Uh, so even if the bank manager was only involved on one side of the transaction, which we know he wasn't, um, the loan to the Browers would have represented a significant step along the manager's path to achieving that target. That's correct. And as I understood your evidence yesterday, you said that the discretionary bonus that the manager would be entitled to would not automatically be granted just because he reached his lending target. Is that right? Uh, it would also depend on the quality of his loans. That's correct. 
among other things. Yes. And you said that an employee who had not reached their sales target, um, but for example was in an area that was drought affected, might still get a bonus in recognition of their work. They may do. Yep. So uh, aside from extreme circumstances that might affect sales performance, would a Rabobank manager be granted a bonus in circumstances where they don't meet their sales targets? Uh, that was the example that, that I just gave. Yes. Yes. No, no, I, I'm asking you to move beyond that example. So I understand that example where there's a drought in the area and therefore it's very difficult to sell loans. Sure. Yes. Um, at some uh, uh, moderation of expectations in yes. terms of the lending targets would be there. Yes. I want to put that to one sa side and say, apart from that, um, would a Rabo bank manager be granted a bonus if they don't achieve their sales targets? Potentially, yes. Uh, so, uh, what are the other types of situations where that could occur? They're numerous. I see. Uh, and, and as an example of that, it may be somebody who's recently commenced in the role. It may be a junior manager that's learning how to become a manager. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it may be a manager who's been ill. Um, there are numerous circumstances, which is why the system is discretionary. Mm. And are sales weighted highly in the consideration in the considerations that are relevant to whether to grant the bonus? Growing the portfolio is the is the primary focus. Yes. Growing it sustainably. So yes, it is. So the the bonus is determination of whether or not to grant the bonus is predominantly driven by sales. I would say it's not weighted formally at that time, so there was no metrics, if you wish. Uh, but yes, it would be. Yeah. It's predominantly driven yes. by sales. Yes. I see. For well, a rural manager, yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, are you aware? Mr James of the um, Retail Banking Remuneration Review issued by Mr Stephen Sedgwick in April last year? I have, I'm aware of it but I haven't studied it. Uh, are you aware of it being uh, discussed within Rabobank? Uh, yes. And the review related to product sales commissions and product based payments in retail banking in Australia? Yes. And Mr Sedgwick made a number of recommendations which he suggested be implemented by all banks by no later than 2020. Are you aware of that? Yes, I am. All right. Could I ask you to look at RCD 0003 Thank you. So this is the uh, Retail Banking Remuneration Review, the report of Mr Sedgwick, dated the 19th of April 2017. And could I ask you to turn within that document to 0109. You see there clause 3.2, remuneration structures for retail bank staff. I recommend that the following apply to all retail bank staff roles in scope for this review, namely tellers, sellers, including home lenders and in scope financial advisors and managers. Now, uh, your rural managers were in scope for this review, weren't they? Yes. Uh, the number two there, banks remove variable reward payments and campaign related incentives that are directly linked to sales or the achievement of sales targets, including but not limited to cross sales, referral targets and profit and revenue targets. And number three, eligibility to receive any variable reward payment should be based on an overall assessment against a range of factors that reflect the breadth of the responsibilities of each role. You see that? Yes. And could I then ask you to look at 0115 And Mr Sedgwick here is discussing ways of determining remuneration in a manner that's consistent with the recommendations that I've just taken you to. And Rabobank's approach appears to involve management discretion, uh, which is approach three in this document. Variable rewards based on management discretion against individual performance measures or targets. 
the variable reward amount is based on management's assessment of an individual's performance against targets or other measures. These typically include financial targets as well as non-financial measures. This approach would be consistent with recommendation two if and only if the manager's judgment takes all factors into account and is not predominantly driven by sales. Yes. Do you see that? I do. So Rabobank's approach is not yet consistent with the recommendations of the Sedgwick Review? On our current remuneration structure or on, on the yes. remuneration? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I haven't considered that. Um, with our current remuneration structure with rural managers, uh, they are still incentivised to grow our business mm -hmm. through loan sales. Mm -hmm. Uh, they are disincentivised to, to write loans that aren't sustainable. Um, and from that, I believe there's a balance within our discretionary system. Mm -hmm. But the balance isn't enough, is what I'm putting to you, Mr James, because you've told me that the exercise of the discretion is predominantly driven by sales. Qualified by, qual very clearly qualified by uh, the quality uh, of the loans that are written. I accept that those are additional matters but I'm referring to your evidence that the predominant matter in the determination as to whether or not to exercise a discretion to grant the bonus is sales. It is. And therefore, your current remuneration practices uh, for your rural bank managers, I'm putting to you, are not consistent uh, with the position that Mr Sedgwick requires all banks to move to by 2020. Yes. Uh, are there changes that are going to be made to ensure that they are? I'm not sure of what the changes proposed are between now and 2020. The current system would fall just short of that, I would suggest. Yes. Have we tended the Sedgwick Review? Not in we, we don't think we've tended the Sedgwick, Sedgwick Review document, Commissioner, so I will tender it. Exhibit 4.57, Sedgwick uh, Retail Banking Remuneration Review, RCD 0003-0073-0096. Exhibit 4.57. Now, returning to 2011 with the Browers, uh, when the bank manager that we've been speaking of moved to another branch, uh, most of his clients were transferred to another bank manager. That was Mr Greg Brady. That's correct. And Mr Brady, you tell us in your statement, became the Browers relationship manager in late May or early June of That's 2011. Right. And... Uh, you tell us also in your statement that the visit that Mrs Brower referred to in her evidence yesterday, the visit from the previous bank manager and Mr Brady, uh, took place in May 2011. That's correct. Uh, and you say the Browers were told in that visit that Mr Brady would be taking over as their bank manager? That's correct. And you also say that it was during that visit that the Browers asked for the further funds that the bank had told them would be available to assist them with stocking the properties on their return. That's correct. Uh, and you tell us that after the meeting, Mrs Brower followed up with Mr Brady about that request. Yes. And Mr Brady responded and asked for further financial information and said he'd look at that and then discuss with the Browers. That's correct. And the Browers provided that information sought by Mr Brady? They did. And you tell us in your statement that Mr Brady concluded from his analysis of that information that substantial asset sales would be required to be undertaken by the Browers and applied to reduce their overall debt levels as a condition of the extension of their facilities. Yes, he did. And he told the Browers this? Yes, he did. Uh, so the Browers were told that the bank was only willing to provide the 300000 that they needed um, if they agreed to repay the $3 million through the sale of one of their properties. That's correct. And did you hear the evidence of Mrs Brower yesterday about her reaction when she was told that? Yes, I did. Um, that they'd always known they would need support from the bank when they came back and that the bank manager had known that as well? That's correct. But Mrs Brower and her husband consented to the proposal from the bank? That's correct. And you heard Mrs Brower's evidence that she felt they had no other choice? Yes, that's correct. And Mr Brady prepared a credit submission for the variation of the Brower's facility, didn't he? He did. And you've annexed that to your statement as Exhibit 46. It's RAL 
0002-0001-3362. And we see at Three three six two. That the proposal is described there as an increase to the loan limit with a new limit of four million dollars. That's correct. And there was a principal repayment of three million dollars due thirty June two thousand and thirteen from the sale of a security property. That's correct. And if we turn to three three six six. We see under the heading Covenant and Insurance Compliance and or Account Strategy a recommendation of an addition of a special condition or, or two special conditions, asset to be sold and permanent reductions. Yes. Thank you. Now, uh, you accept in your statement to the Commission that the terms on which the 300000 was provided to the Browers didn't meet the expectations on the part of the Browers that was created by the email that they received from the relationship manager, the bank manager, on the 22nd of September 2009? Yes, I accept that. And you accept that the bank's conduct in creating that expectation on the part of the Browers that was not subsequently met was unfair? I accept that also. And that in that sense there was a breach of Clause 2.2 of the Code of Banking Practice? In terms of the fairness, yes. Yes, uh, which therefore could be characterised as misconduct. It may be. Uh, it should be, yes. Well, it, it is misconduct, isn't it? A breach of the Code of Banking Practice is misconduct. A breach of the Code of con con Banking Practice is misconduct, Thank yes. you. Uh, now, you didn't accept this in the first version of the statement that you provided to the Commission, did you? No, I didn't. Why not? Uh, I didn't have the, the uh, time, I suppose, and having spoken to all of the parties involved, to completely assess uh, the position that well, I've come to the conclusion now, having not viewed this file at all prior to three weeks ago. What, what time did you need, Mr James? Um, the Browers believed that the bank would give them $300,000 to support them when they returned to Australia. When they came back and asked for it, the bank said, only if you sell and give us $3 million within two years. What time did you need to assess whether that was fair? I think when I first viewed that, I, as I, I did mention earlier, I viewed that in the context of whether or not Mr and Mrs Brow had other reserves to be able to complete that uh, acquisition of those cattle. Uh, when I sat and reflected and spoke to the people involved, the internal staff involved, it became apparent to me that it was reasonable for Mr and Mrs Brow to accept that. So that, that's why my view changed. It's the only reason my view changed. I see. I, as I said, I didn't stop reviewing this file when I signed that sworn statement. I see. Now, in the lead up to the 30th of June 2013, the deadline imposed by the bank for the payment of the $3 million, Mr Brady sent a letter to the Browers reminding them of that deadline, didn't he? Yes, he did. And you've exhibited that to your statement. It's Exhibit 14. Uh, RAL 0002 0001 <clears throat> So it's a letter dated the 18th of March 2013. So on that date we see um, that the bank told the Browers that it remained committed to the special condition contained within the letter of offer. Yes. And at the same time that this letter was sent to the Browers, the bank started thinking about transferring the Browers file to asset management? That's correct. And on the 5th of June 2013, a couple of weeks before the deadline, Mr Brady and Mr Ohl, who was to be the asset, manage, manage, asset manager for the file, uh, went to visit the Browers at their farm and reinforced that it was the bank's expectation that the Browers would repay the amount. That's correct. 
All right. Um, can I ask you to look at your Exhibit 22, RAL 0002, 0003, 0001? This is a file note of that meeting at the Browers Farm on the 5th of June 2013. Yes. Do you know who prepared this file note, Mr James? Uh, I believe the account manager, Greg Brady. Greg Brady, thank you. And we see in this file note a reference uh, in the second paragraph, in the bottom third of the page, Adrian Brower made particular mention of his concern. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Adrian, Adrian Brower made particular mention of his concern as to why the bank had lent them the money for purchasing Jamboree and within three or so years required that money be repaid. Yes. Uh, so this was something that was discussed at that meeting at the farm on this date? That's correct. And we see that in closing summary at the bottom of the page, and if we could have the subsequent page brought up on the screen at the same time, in closing summary, Greg Brady stated that the principal repayment was due and would trigger at the due date should no further consideration be taken of this matter by the bank. The Browers requested consideration by the bank for additional time to sell their home block Kaiora and asked if the bank would delay the principal repayment. That's correct. And we see from this file note that that request was noted and the Browers were told that it would be considered. That's correct. And the bank did subsequently agree to a 12-month extension? Yes, we did. To the 30th of June 2014? Yes, we did. But the Browers were still unable to pay the $3 million by that date? That's correct. And the day after that deadline expired, on the 1st of July 2014, the bank started charging the Browers default interest on the amount on which they were in excess of their loan limit. That's correct. The limit had expired back to a million dollars. And the default interest rate was 4% above the ordinary rate? That's correct. On the defaulted amount, yes. And the Browers ultimately accrued $115,490 in default interest? That's correct. And in October 2014, the bank transferred the Browers file to asset management? Yes. And in May 2015, uh, a farm debt mediation took place? That's correct. And prior to the farm debt mediation, the Browers solicitor asked the bank's solicitor the documents from Rabobank and answers to certain questions to help them prepare for the farm debt mediation. Is that right? Uh, was that the email received two days before farm debt mediation? Yes, I'll show you the email. Yes, um, yes. But before that email was sent, Mrs Brower had already told the bank that she didn't have any documents because her computer had crashed shortly after the uh, process of purchasing Jamboree started. Is that the email the week before farm debt mediation? Uh, no, that, that's something that you refer to in your statement. I believe that's um, a little earlier. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but do you recall that? that I, I recall her, the correspondence, Her computer yes. had crashed, so she didn't have the documents. Yes. Uh, then uh, can I take you to the emails just prior to the mediation, RAL 0002, 0003, 0518... We'll um, need to blow these up because they're, um, as you can see, quite small. I want to start with uh, an email uh, down the bottom of the page, in the bottom half of the page. So we see there an email from the Browers solicitor to the bank solicitors on the 13th of May 2015. Yes. And in that email, the Browers solicitor set out his understanding of his client's situation based on his review of material that had been provided by the bank in the form of a brief for the farm debt mediation. Yes. 
and he asked if the bank agreed to his summary uh, of that situation. That's correct. And he also asked for copies of all applications, emails, letters and cash flows developed in relation to the purchase of Jamboree with the possible scenarios of leases terminating and the application and cash flows in relation to the additional funding of $300,000. Do you see that? I do see that, yes. Uh, and we see that uh, the solicitor also asked a series of questions. We can see the start of them on this page, uh, and there are others on the following page that arose from his understanding of the events. He wanted to know how the bank had prudentially determined that the clients had a capacity to repay the debt as and when the leases terminated when the loan was approved in 2010. That's correct. Uh, and over the page at 0519, he asked how the bank justified providing the additional funding of 300,000 for livestock when it imposed additional requirements seeking a huge principal reduction. That's correct. And then if we go back to 0518, we see the bank's response two days later on the 15th of May. The initial response in the middle of the page was that the person at the client from whom the solicitors took instructions was on leave and uh, instructions were being sought. And then further up the page on the 18th of May, a full response was given based on instructions. Yes. And in that full response, we see that the bank did not answer the questions that were posed. That's correct. And the bank did not provide the documents that were sought. That's correct. All the bank did was to maintain that it had acted appropriately throughout the banking relationship, that it had properly assessed the applications for finance which were made, and that any allegation to the contrary was denied, with the bank reserving all of its rights. That's correct. Now, in the second witness statement that you provided to the Commission on Friday last week, <clears throat> you now accept that the bank should have provided the documents that were sought by the Browers solicitor prior to the mediation? Yes. And you accept that it was unfair for the Browers to be required to attend the mediation when they didn't have documents that would have been assistance to, of assistance to them in the mediation? Yes, we do accept that and you accept that the bank's conduct was unfair and fell below community standards of expect and ex expectations? In this instance, I believe so, yes. And you also accept that it um, could be characterised as misconduct because it may have breached Clause 2.2 of the Code of Banking Practice on the basis of being unfair? Yes. The fair thing to do would have been to provide the documents if they were available or if they weren't immediately available to offer to postpone the mediation to a later date, wouldn't it? It would have and the option to do so was available to all parties but I think we should have done that. Yes, well you were the ones who had the documents and the information and you refused to provide it. In that time frame, yes. Yes. And again, I think all parties have the option to defer mediation, but I believe we should well, have offered that. Why, why would the Browers think it was worth deferring the mediation? You'd made your position clear, which was that you weren't going to provide the documents or information, and your position was that you'd done nothing wrong. Correct. So what, what would they have gained by deferring the mediation? Uh, for mine, when I read that, I would have thought that the... The correct position was for us to defer mediation this or I'm not stepping aside from that. All I'm yes. trying to do is to explain from my point of view, my own review of the file, that I believe that option was available to all parties, including their legal counsel. That we didn't, I maintain, was, was not fair. I'm just struggling to understand the basis on which you say that was an option available to the Browers. Do you think they should have continued trying to persuade the bank to provide the documents and information? They could have, yes. <laughs> In, in the face of this communication from the bank solicitors, Mr James? That's my position on it, Ms Hall. Do you think there's anything in this email that suggested to them that the bank might reconsider its position? It doesn't appear so, no. No. So the Browers... Just a moment, Ms Hall. The questions which the solicitor for the Browers was asking the bank were the questions which the first credit officer had asked about the first credit proposal, weren't they? They were. 
Yeah. And is there any record, I don't think I've yet seen a record produced by Rabobank which shows uh, a credit officer uh, recording satisfaction of the uh, questions that had been posed in that first response? I look for that also, Commissioner. I haven't been able to see it. In, in the approving comments, um, they weren't included. Because those questions were put on the table before the mediation began. Is that right? Yes. They were questions that the bank internally had raised at the outset of this file. In 2009, yes. Yes. What should the bank have done when it went into the mediation, knowing that the Browers lawyers had asked these questions, which were questions the bank had asked and mm. to which you can find no answer in the files of the bank? What, what should the bank have done at mediation? I think at, at media, uh, prior to mediation, I think we should have had that full and frank conversation with Mr. and Mrs. Brown as to what led to the position that existed. Our, our view of the mediation and, and our intention of what should have happened at mediation was a resolution going forward, not a forensic of what had happened in the past. But we should have, we should have been privy to that information with Mr. and Mrs. Brown before mediation. You speak of not a... Uh a forensic inquiry into what had happened in the past. Um, is it any part of that mediation process? And you may say it's not. Uh, for the bank to understand, uh, putting it colloquially, where the customer is coming from. Yeah. What it is that the customer feels aggrieved about. Is, is that something that uh, is important, unimportant, relevant, irrelevant? Uh, or are we uh, at mediation, do you say the bank looks forward, we are at this point, how do we go forward? What's the, the answer? I think to go forward we have to consider the past in these circumstances. I think the, the position that, that, that uh, we <coughs> take at mediation from, and, and I'm not the mediator, or I'm not the person that, that predominantly does mediations, this is my interpretation, Commissioner, that I understand that, that we are trying to resolve going forward uh, and, and in doing so I believe that we should also consider what's led to the circumstances. Whether or not the mediation is used as a platform for the analysis of that, I don't think that is productive in the context of mediation, but I also don't think it would be fair, and that is why I've pointed to this being unfair, that we attend mediation without the benefit of what led to the position. That's my personal position, Commissioner. Mr James, the outcome of the farm debt mediation was that the bank agreed not to take enforcement action and to rebate the default interest on the basis that the Browers would sell Jamboree for not less than $2 million by the end of the year and that they would pay a total of $4 million to the bank by the middle of the following year, the 30th of June 2016. That's correct. And why did the bank press the Browers to repay the entirety of their loan facility at this time, rather than the $3 million that was the subject of the special condition? Um, I, th I, I believe the context of that was to, uh, to satisfy the requirement to get the debt to what we perceived was a manageable level. Uh, and moving forward from that point for Mr and Mrs Brow to refinance, I'm not... Uh, entirely sure of the rationale for that, I'm sorry. Well, to get the debt to a manageable level, that would have got rid of all of the debt, wouldn't it? No, getting the debt to a manageable level in the context of farm debt mediation, I believe, was to put a floor of uh, $2 million in the um, funds generated from the sale of the property. Yes. Um, which limited our uh, write-off, I suppose, in the circumstance we were looking at, and put a ceiling in it for Mr and Mrs Brower at $4 million, providing they achieved a figure above that $2 million. The residual debt uh, of somewhere uh, in between $1 million and $1.5 million 
would have been, in our view, I, I imagine, at the time, sustainable with the remaining property of Kiora servicing it. I believe that's the view that was taken. Well, did the bank want to get the Browers off their books? Well, the, that is the inference from that. I, there was nothing I read to indicate that we, did, that, that we didn't have a, a, uh, a desire to continue to be associated with the Browers. Nothing through any of this has indicated that we had a desire not to deal with Mr and Mrs Brower. But the bank didn't appear to be interested in settling for the Browers, selling Jamboree, paying the proceeds of sale and then supporting them to continue farming on Kaiora? No, that's not how. The, that's correct. That's not how the deal was struck. Why not? I can't give an answer, I'm sorry. I don't know, that's why I can't give an answer. Um, you accept in your statement that the Browers incurred a capital loss of approximately half a million dollars as a result of their acquisition and sale of Jamboree? Uh, this is purely the difference between the purchase price and the sale price. Yes. yes. That's not the entirety of the loss they incurred, is it? Uh, well, it wouldn't be, no. 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 And do you accept that the bank manager's conduct in initiating and executing the plan for the Browers to borrow money to purchase Jamboree was an was unacceptable conduct? I don't think it was full and complete, and it probably does, in, in, in reviewing the file, it probably does make it, uh, probably does make it unacceptable. Mm. I hadn't considered that wording, um, but when I fully, fully and frankly reflect on this, I think so. This wasn't conduct of a diligent and prudent banker, was it? I think the communication between the two parties wasn't what it should have been. Well, the problems were much deeper than communication, weren't they? I think they'll predicate. Sorry. I'm sorry. I think they'll predicated on communication. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I point and I point out that Mr. and Mrs. Brower were advised by uh, farm advisors as well in this mm -hmm. in this case, and, mm -hmm. and it was incumbent on us to ensure that we provided sufficient capital for Mr. and Mrs. Brower to complete the purchase. It was incumbent on us to ensure for for the bank's position as well as Mr. and Mrs. Brower's position to ensure that it was adequately funded, and if it couldn't be adequately funded, that it shouldn't have proceeded. Well, the, Bra the Browse relied on the relationship manager, the bank manager. They relied on his advice before entering into the loan, didn't they? Uh, ad advice, uh, I, I think, is something that we uh, are very, very cautious of providing. I understand. Very cautious, uh, for good reason. Uh, but I believe that, that Mr and Mrs Brow, with the external advice that they had, were well informed. And I also believe that Mr and Mrs Brower had a, a good understanding of business, having a corporate structure uh, that we viewed uh, with the trust that they had established as well as the off-farm investments they had. Mm -hmm. I believe they are of good economic, um, or rather good understanding of the economic circumstances they were going so into. So they had some investment properties and they had a trust structure? They had four or five trusts, I believe, yes. Mm -hmm. And what I want to put to you I'm not is deflecting, I'm sorry, I'm not deflecting. I'm, just for completeness, just trying to understand where that communication uh, should have rested. It was certainly with the bank, but I think it was with all parties. Yes, because they relied on the bank, didn't they? Relied on the bank as well as their advisors, I would imagine, yes. Yes. Now, Rabobank has a code of conduct, doesn't it? Yes, we do. Uh, and Rabobank markets itself as a socially responsible bank? Yes, we do. And your code of conduct makes clear that Rabobank consciously shares in the responsibility for the living environment of our customers. We are a socially responsible bank that sets store by the well-being and prosperity of people. That's correct. Did Rabobank's employees act consistently with that statement in their dealings with the Browers? I think the intention was consistent with it, but the execution may not have been. Um, you may have heard in my opening statement at the start of these hearings my reference to the two submissions that the Commission received from Rabobank uh, in response to the Commission's request for information from the bank about its misconduct and its conduct that fell below community standards and expectations. Yes. And Rabobank made no acknowledgement of misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations in relation to the Browers in either of those submissions, did it? Uh, no. But late on Monday afternoon this week, after I had delivered that opening statement, Rabobank's lawyers sent the Commission a letter saying that Rabobank now wished to add its conduct in relation to the Browers to the acknowledgements that it had made in those two submissions. That's correct. 
it was only after the Commission investigated the circumstances of the Browers and required Rabobank to produce documents and statements that Rabobank has conceded the misconduct and conduct falling below community standards and expectations that it engaged in with the Browers. Uh, for completeness, uh, that came about because we internally investigated that at the request of the Commission, the, the situation yes. at the request of the Commission. And that information in full became available to us and that is why we rightfully volunteered it to the Commission. Yes. It wasn't withheld because it wasn't oh, known. No. It wasn't I'm known. not suggesting it was Thank withheld. You. No, Thank I'm you. suggesting that it was as a result of the Commission Absolutely. requiring Rabobank to produce documents and uh, provide a statement uh, it was as a result of that that Rabobank has got to the position it's now got to, which is a concession of misconduct and conduct falling below community standards and expectations. The Commission gave us the opportunity to fully review the file. Yes, I agree. Uh, I want to put to you that Rabobank has made those concessions reluctantly, initially telling the Commission that there was no misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations, and only changing that position after the Commission published the list of entities whose conduct it was going to examine in these hearings and it became clear that Rabobank would need to give evidence in these proceedings. Mm. I don't accept that notion. I see. And, and, and I can personally vouch for that, Ms Orr, because I was the one that conducted the review. And before I picked this file up three weeks ago, I was not sure of the extent to which uh, uh, these actions uh, played out. So I can personally tell you, Ms Orr, that uh, we weren't privy to it, and because after my investigation, we became privy to it. Mm. It wasn't information that was held elsewhere and not volunteered. Mm -hmm. But on but your first review of that information, you conceded no misconduct. In that short period of time, having not reviewed the file before that, yes. Mm -hmm. to, not, to not have continued reviewing that file after I signed that witness statement, would have been improper. Yes. And I understand that you've, you're referring to that uh, on a couple of occasions, and I respect that, but I do need to make it clear that I learned as I went. Yes. And it would have been improper to not continue to review it. And, and then to have not put forward what I learned subsequently. Yes. yes. So I stand by that. And does Rabobank propose to remediate the Browers in any way? I haven't considered that. Will you consider that? In this forum, I don't feel comfortable considering that. I think it's something that should be done uh, um, without the public gaze, uh, I think it should be something that should be referred to our should be referred to our executive, and I think it's something we will quietly consider. Thank you, Mr. James. I have no further questions. Three matters, Ms. Or first, yes. uh, housekeeping: the emails browse solicitors uh, to Robo Bank between 13 and 18 May 2015. RAL 0002 0003 0518. Exhibit 4.58. I think, I think, and I'm sorry, I might uh, not have made this clear, but they are, uh, I think, an exhibit to your second statement in. provided to the Commission on Friday last week. Yes, they are. Yes. Need not mark them again. Uh, two, did we ever get to the bottom of uh, uh, the uh, performance review? We think we have it. It's not redacted. We think no. we have it, but it hasn't been through the redaction process, and I would need to confirm with Rabobank's counsel that the one we have is the correct one. Uh, it, it might be prudent to take a few minutes to resolve that before Mr James leaves the witness box. Yes. Uh, the third thing, Mr James, just going back to the brows, of course, uh, you, you spoke of it towards the end of your evidence as... Uh, a matter hinging around communication. Do you remember that yes, I do. passage of yes, I answers? Do. Did Rabobank ever record in its files a conclusion that the initial proposal was serviceable? No. Therefore, does it follow that Rabobank never recorded in its files how the initial proposal would have been serviceable. That's correct. I just wonder and raise for your comment whether 
that may not be at the heart of this matter, rather than some want of communication between banker and customer? I believe uh, that the communication issue would not have arisen had the uh, had that circumstance not arose in the first place. Yes, communication would not have become uh, central to the issue had the loan been uh, assessed properly in the first place, as proposed. And it was not. Not as proposed by Mr. and Mrs. Brewer. No. Yes. Now. Uh, if I... I think, Commissioner, if we could have a slightly longer break so that we can find and consider that document. Well, do I would come back at 22 or quarter to? Quarter to would be helpful. Quarter to. Thank you, Commissioner. All right. Uh, we'll keep you a little longer, Mr James, and uh, Thank you. I'll resume at uh, quarter to midday. Thank you, Commissioner. We've located that document, Commissioner. I don't propose to ask any questions about it, but I understand it will be tendered uh, by Rabobank. Yes. So I have no further questions for the witness. Yes. Yes, Mr. McGrath. Um, Mr. James, uh, yesterday you were asked questions about um, lending ratio guidelines of the bank that were in place at the time that uh, the proposal for the acquisition of Jamboree was uh, considered. Um, if I could just bring up, up a document um, before you. It's uh, RAL 0005 0008 0232. Now, could you please have a look at that document and then I'll ask you a question in relation to it. Do you identify that as being the uh, lending ratio guidelines that were in place at the time that the loan for the acquisition of Jamboree was assessed? Uh, they're the guidelines as at December 2008, yes. Yes, and that those ones were in place at the time of the assessment in 2009? Yes, they were. Um, and Mr. James, um, as you have mentioned in your evidence, uh, you uh, picked up the file three weeks ago and you've reviewed it and you've given your statements and your evidence. Is there anything thing further that you wish to say on behalf of Rabobank in relation to this matter? Well, there is one thing I'd like to add. And what is that? Uh, if I may direct this to, to Mr and Mrs Brewer, um, that on behalf of personally myself and on behalf of Rabobank uh, to express regret um, at how this transaction's unfolded, and, and I sincerely mean that, so, and I wish you well. There's no further questions. Mr. James, do you propose to tender the lending ratio guidelines, or are they uh, already in? Um, sorry, I wish to tender that document together with a number of others, uh, Commissioner. Yes, well, Rabobank lending ratio guidelines at 24 December 08 RAL 0005 0008 0232 is exhibit 4.58. Um, there are no further questions of Mr James. There is a tender, however, that I wish to yes. make. Um, and that is uh, there are a set of documents that are listed uh, on this uh, hard copy document, Commissioner which are documents that um, are, ten are tendered on behalf of Rabobank with the consent of council assisting. Um, they are in the hearing book and the set of the document IDs are contained in it. Do you wish me to read out each of the document IDs or simply have the document itself provided to the commission? Uh, provide the document. Uh, if I can uh, uh, see the document, I'll rattle off the... Uh uh, exhibit numbers so that we can keep our uh, uh, exhibit numbering system uh, running. Uh, how many have we got? Um, there are a total of 28 documents in there. There might be a change of plan happening at this point, <laughs> uh, Mr McGrath. Um,
documents on the list will be come in order, exhibits 4.59 to 4.86. Uh, so the Rabo tender list, uh, if that can ultimately be incorporated into the uh, uh, transcript as part of the uh, exhibits. So Thank you, Commissioner. Takes me to what? 486. Yes. Um, there is a further tender, which is a document which has now just been provided in hard copy to the council assisting. Um, it, rates, it relates to the issue of the, um, the current uh, key performance indicators of a rural manager. Um, perhaps I can have that document tendered through Mr James before he leaves the box. Yes, that's why I kept him here, yes. Um, could I provide a copy of that document? Yes. Uh, if to I think it can go to Mr. James, please. Uh, Thank you. Um, Mr. James, do you uh, recognise that as a document entitled uh, Rural Manager? Um, could you please um, inform the Commission? if you agree that this is a, uh, a set of the current key performance indicators for the position of Rural Manager at Rubbobank Australia Limited? Yes, it is. And the position of Rural Manager is effectively the same position as that of the, uh, the, the manager who has been described in relation to dealing with the brewers? Yes, it is. Um, I tender that document. Rubbobank KPIs, Rural Manager, bracket current, uh, will be exhibit 4.87. Um, may I have a moment to yeah. provide this document? Uh, could I provide you with a further document? Can you please look at that document, Mr James? You were asked some questions by council assisting about the performance improvement plan for the manager involved in the transaction with the Browers? Yes. Um, you said that the one that had been provided was not the correct one. Um, can you identify this as being uh, a document that relates to the performance improvement plan for that particular manager? Yes, yes it is, yes. Um, I tender that document. Have we got a doc ID on that one yet? Uh, yes, here. RAL 0004-0004-0040. Performance Improvement Plan Browse Manager, RAL 0004-0004-0040, Exhibit 4.88. Thank you, Commissioner. There's nothing further. Yes. James, thank you. You may step down. You're excused. Thank you. Commissioner, that concludes the case study <clears throat> in relation to Rabobank. We're moving now to a case study in relation to Bank West. Um, we may need to have another short adjournment to allow Bank West Council uh, to take their place at the bar table. Yeah, if I come back at midday or shortly before midday. Yes, that's fine. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes. Well,